Blood of the Fold by Terry Goodkind. Continuing on page 179. You yourself, Philippa, have passed a test of pain. You would have fought to be prelate. You've worked for hundreds of years toward the goal of being at least in serious contention. Events cheated you out of that chance, yet you have never said one bitter word to me, though you must feel the pain every time you look at me. Instead, you have done your best to advise me in the post and have worked in the interest of the palace despite that pain. Would I be better served had I insisted you be tested by torture to become my advisor? Would that have proven anything? Sister Philippa's cheeks had mantled. I won't lie by pretending to agree with you, but at least I now understand that you have indeed been shoveling dirt out of the hole and are not simply abandoning it as dry because you didn't want to sweat. I will carry out your directive at once, Verna. Verna smiled. Thank you, Philippa. Philippa betrayed the slightest hint of a smile. Richard created quite an upheaval around here. I thought he was going to try to kill us all. And he turns out to have been a greater friend to the palace than any wizard in 3,000 years. Verna barked a laugh. If you only knew how many times I had to pray for the strength not to strangle him. As Philippa left, Verna could see through the door into the outer office that Millie was awaiting permission to enter and do the cleaning. Verna stretched with a yawn, picked up the report she had set aside and went to the door. She waved Millie into her office as she turned her attention to her two administrators, sisters Dulcinea and Phoebe. Before Verna could speak, sister Dulcinea stood with a stack of reports. If you're ready, prelate, we have these in order for you. Verna took the stack about the weight of an infant and rested it on a hip. Yes, all right, thank you, it's late. Uh, why don't you two be off? Sister Phoebe shook her head. I don't mind, prelate. I enjoy the work and, and tomorrow is another long day of it. I won't have you nodding off because you don't get enough sleep. Now be off, the both of you. Phoebe scooped up a sheaf of papers, probably to take to her own office so she could continue working. Phoebe seemed to think that they were in a paper race. Whenever she suspected there was even a remote chance Verna might actually catch up, she worked frantically, producing more of the stuff, almost as if by magic. Dulcinea plucked her cup of tea from the desk, leaving the papers. She worked at a measured pace, never lowering herself to scrambling to stay ahead of Verna, but she still managed to produce stacks of reports, sorted and annotated, almost at will. Neither needed to fear that Verna would catch up with them. Every day set her further behind. Both sisters bade their farewells, offering their hope that the Creator would grant the prelate a restful sleep. Verna waited until they reached the outer door. Oh, Sister Dulcinea, I have a little matter I'd like you to take care of tomorrow. Of course, prelate, what is it? Verna placed the report she had brought on Dulcinea's desk, where it would be the first thing she would see when she sat down in the morning. A request for support from a young woman and her family. One of our young wizards is to be a father. Phoebe squealed. Oh, that's wonderful. We pray that with the Creator's blessing it will be a boy and have the gift. There hasn't been one born with the gift in the city since... Well, I can't even remember the last time. Maybe this time Verna's scowl finally brought her to silence. Verna turned her attention to Sister Dulcinea. I want to see this young woman and the young man responsible for her condition. Tomorrow you will arrange an appointment. Perhaps her parents should be there as well, since they are requesting assistance. Sister Dulcinea, a blank expression on her face, leaned in a little. Is there a problem, prelate? Verna hiked the load of reports up higher on her hip. I should say there is. One of our young men got the woman pregnant. Sister Dulcinea set her tea down on the corner of the desk as she took a step closer. But, prelate, we allow our charges to go into the city for this very reason. It not only lets them dissipate their impulses so they may devote themselves to their studies, but it also on occasion nets us one with the gift. I will not sanction the palace meddling in creation and the lives of innocent people. Sister Dulcinea's blue eyes glanced the length of Verna's simple dark blue dress. Prelate, men have uncontrollable urges. So do I. But with the Creator's help, I've so far managed not to strangle anyone. Phoebe's laugh was cut short by a scalding glance from Sister Dulcinea. Prelate, men are different. They can't control themselves. Allowing this simple diversion keeps their minds focused on their lessons. The palace can well afford the recompense. 
It's a small price to pay in view of the fact that it on occasion results in gaining us a young wizard. The charge of the palace is to teach our young men to use their gift in a responsible fashion, with restraint, and knowing full well the consequences of wielding their ability. When we encourage them to act in the exact opposite fashion with regard to other aspects of their lives, it undermines our teachings. As to the occasional result of one with the gift being born from these indiscriminate couplings, there is no evidence that it's of benefit. Who is to say that were they to act with more responsibility and control, the results of meaningful couplings in their future wouldn't produce more than a dismal percentage of offspring with the gift? For all we know, their lascivious indiscretion could be diluting their ability to pass on the gift, or developing it to its highest chances, poor though they are. Verna shrugged. Perhaps. But I do know that those fishermen out on the river don't spend their entire lives fishing the exact same spot because they once caught a fish there. Since we are netting few fish, I think it's time for us to move on. Sister Dulcinea clasped her hands in an effort to be patient. Prelate, the Creator blessed people with their nature, such as it is, and there is no way we can alter it. Men and women are going to go on doing what gives them pleasure. Of course they are, but as long as we pay the cost of the results, we encourage more of it. If there are no consequences, then there will be no self-control. How many children have grown up without the benefit of a father because we give pregnant young women gold? Does that gold replace nurturing? How many lives have we altered to their detriment with our gold? Dulcinea spread her hands in dismay. Our gold helps them. Our gold encourages the women in the city to act irresponsibly and to bed our young men because it means a life of support without qualifications. Verna swept her free hand around, indicating the city. We are demeaning these people with our gold. We have rendered them little more than breeding stock. But we have used this method for thousands of years to help augment those with the gift we can find. Hardly any with the gift are born anymore. I realize that. But we're in the business of teaching people, not breeding them. Our gold reduces them to creatures acting out of want of gold, instead of people having a child out of love. Sister Dulcinea was stricken mute for only a moment. How can we be seen as so heartless as to deny the help of a little of our gold? Lives are more important than gold. I've seen the reports. It's hardly a little amount of gold. But that's beside the point. The point is that we are breeding our Creator's fellow children like livestock, and in so doing, we are breeding contempt for values. But we teach our young men values. As the Creator's highest creation, people respond to the teaching of values because they have the intellect to understand its importance. Verna sighed. Sister, suppose we preached truthfulness and at the same time gladly handed out a penny for each lie told. What do you venture would be the result? Sister Phoebe covered her mouth as she laughed. I'd venture we'd soon be penniless. Sister Dulcinea's blue eyes were ice. I didn't realize you were so heartless, prelate, as to let the Creator's newborn children go hungry. The Creator gave their mothers breasts so they might suckle their children, not so they could wile gold from the palace. Sister Dulcinea's face went crimson. But men have uncontrollable urges. Verna's voice lowered with heat. The only time a man's urges are truly uncontrollable is when a sorceress casts a glamour. No sister has cast a glamour spell over any of the women in the city. Need I remind you that were a sister to do so, she would be lucky to be put out of the palace if not hanged. As you well know, a glamour is the moral equivalent to rape. Dulcinea's face had gone white. I'm not saying... Verna glanced to the ceiling in thought. As I recall, the last time a sister was caught casting a glamour was... What? Fifty years ago? Sister Dulcinea's gaze sought refuge, but found none. It was a novice prelate, not a sister. Verna kept her glare on Dulcinea. You were on the tribunal, as I also recall. Dulcinea nodded. And you voted to hang her. A poor young woman who had only been here for a few brief years, and you voted to put her to death. It's the law, prelate, she said without looking up. It is the maximum of the law. Others voted the same as I. Verna nodded. Yes, they did. A tie, 6-6. Six, six. Prelate Annalena broke the deadlock by voting to have the young woman banished. Sister Dulcinea's penetrating blue eyes finally came up. I still say she was wrong. Valdora vowed undying vengeance. 
She swore to destroy the palace of the prophets. She spat in the prelate's face and promised someday to kill her. Verna wrinkled her brow. I always wondered, Dulcinea, why you were selected to be on the tribunal. Sister Dulcinea swallowed, because I was her instructor. Really? Her teacher? Verna clicked her tongue. Where do you suppose the young woman ever learned to cast a glamour? The color returned to Sister Dulcinea's face in a rush. We were never able to establish that with certitude. Probably her mother. A mother often teaches a young sorceress such things. Yes, I've heard that. But I wouldn't know. My mother wasn't gifted. She was a skip. Your mother was gifted, if I recall. Yes, she was. Sister Dulcinea kissed her ring finger while whispering a prayer to the Creator, a private act of supplication and devotion done frequently, but rarely in front of others. It's getting late, prelate. We don't wish to keep you any longer, Verna smiled. Yes, good night, then. Sister Dulcinea bent in a formal bow. As you command, prelate, tomorrow I will see to the matter of the pregnant woman and young wizard after I clear it with Sister Leoma. Verna lifted an eyebrow. Oh? And now Sister Leoma outranks the prelate, yes? Well, no, prelate, Sister Dulcinea stammered. It's just that Sister Leoma likes me to... I just thought you would want me to inform your advisor of your action so that she would not be caught unawares. Sister Leoma is my advisor, sister. I will inform her of my actions if I deem it necessary. Phoebe's round face tilted from one woman to the other as she silently watched the exchange. As you wish, prelate, it will be done, Sister Dulcinea said. Please forgive my enthusiasm in insisting my prelate. Verna shrugged, as best she could with a load of reports. Of course, sister, good night. Thankfully, they both departed without further argument. Grumbling to herself, Verna lugged the stack of reports into her office and dumped them on her desk, beside the ones she had yet to get to. She eyed Millie, off in a corner, scrubbing with a rag at a spot no one would ever see were it to be left there for the next hundred years. The dimly lit office was silent, but for the swishing of Millie's rag and her mumbling to herself under her breath. Verna ambled over to the bookcase, near where the woman was on her knees working, and ran a finger along the volumes without really seeing the gold-leaf titles on the worn spines of the ancient leather covers. How are your old bones tonight, Millie? Oh, don't get me started, prelate, or I'll soon have your hands all over me trying to heal what can't be healed. Age, you know. Her knee nudged the bucket closer as her hand moved on to scrub at another place on the carpet. We all get old. The creator himself must have intended it, as no mortal can heal it. Though I have had more time than most are granted, working here at the palace, I mean. Her tongue poked out of the corner of her mouth as she applied more force to the rag. Yes, the Creator has blessed me with more years than I know what to do with. Verna had never seen the sinewy little woman in anything other than a resolute state of movement. Even when she spoke, her rag constantly wiped at dust, or a thumb rubbed at a spot, or a nail picked at a crust of dirt no one else could see. Verna pulled out a volume and opened it. Well, I know that Prelate Annalena appreciated having you around all those years. Oh, yes, many years it was. My, my, many years. A prelate, I'm coming to discover, has precious little opportunity for friendship. It was good that she had yours. I'm sure I'll find no less comfort in having you around. Millie mumbled a curse at a reluctant bit of dirt. Oh, yes, we had many a talk late into the night. My, my, but she was a wonderful woman, wise and kind. Why, she would listen to anyone, even old Millie. Verna smiled as she absently turned a page in the book, a volume on the arcane laws of a long-dead kingdom. It was so good of you to help her with her ring and the letter, I mean. Millie looked up, a grin coming to her thin lips. Her hand had actually stopped wiping. Ah, so you'll be wanting to know about that like all the others. Verna snapped the book closed. Others? What others? Millie dunked her rag in the soapy water. The sisters, Leoma, Dulcinea, Marin, Philippa, those others. You know them, I'm sure. She licked the end of a finger and rubbed it on the bottom of the dark woodwork, squeaking off a spot. There might have been a few more, I don't recall. Age, you know. They all came to me after the funeral. Not together, mind you, she said with a chuckle. You know, each alone, their eyes watching the shadows as they ask the same as you. Verna had forgotten her pretense at the bookcase. And what did you tell them? Millie wrung her rag. 
The truth, of course, same as I'll tell you if you've a mind to hear it. Yes, Verna said, reminding herself to keep the edge out of her voice. Since I'm the prelate now and all, I think I should hear about it. Why don't you rest a bit and tell me the story? With a grunt of ache, Millie struggled to her feet and turned her sharp eyes on Verna. Why, thank you, prelate, but I've got work to do, you know. I wouldn't want you thinking I'm a slacker, seeking to work my tongue instead of my rag. Verna patted the wiry woman's shoulder. No fear of that, Millie. Tell me about prelate Annalena. Well, now, she was on her deathbed when I saw her. I cleaned Nathan's rooms, too, you know, so that's when I saw her, when I went to Nathan's. The prelate trusted no one but me to go in there with that man. Can't say as I blame her, though the prophet was always kind to me, except when he would go off about something or other, yelling, you know. Not at me, understand, but at his condition and all, being locked in his apartments for all those years. Takes a toll on a man, I suppose. Verna cleared her throat. I imagine it was difficult for you to see the prelate in such a condition. Millie put a hand to Verna's arm. Don't you just know it? Broke my heart it did. But she was in her usual kind humor despite the pain. Verna was biting the inside of her lip. You were telling me about the ring and the letter. Oh, yes. Millie squinted, then reached out and picked a bit of lint from the shoulder of Verna's dress. You should let me brush this out for you. It doesn't do to have people think... Verna took the woman's calloused hand. Millie, this is a bit important to me. Could you please tell me about how you came to have the ring? Millie smiled apologetically. Anne told me she was dying. Said it right out, she did. Millie, I'm dying. Well, I was in tears. She had been my friend for a good long time. She smiled and took my hand just like you have it now and told me that she had one last task she wished me to do. She pulled a ring off her finger and handed it to me. In my other hand, she put that letter sealed with wax and imprinted with the sunburst off the ring. She told me how, when her funeral was going on, I should put the ring on top of the letter on the pedestal I was to take in there. She told me to be careful not to touch the ring to the letter until just at the end, or the magic she had put around it would kill me. She warned me several times to remember to be careful not to touch them together until I did it all proper. She told me just what to do in what order. So that's what I done. I never saw her again after she gave me the ring. Verna stared off out the open doors to the garden she had never had time to visit. When was this? That's a question none of the others asked. Millie mumbled to herself. She stroked a thin finger back and forth across her lower lip. Let's see now. Quite a while back it was. It was way back before the winter solstice. Yes, it was right after the attack, the day you left with young Richard. Now there was a nice boy. Kind as a sunny day he was. Always smiled at me with a how do you do. Most of the other boys don't even see me right there before their eyes, but young Richard always saw me, he did, and had a pleasant word for me, too. Verna only half listened. She remembered the day Millie spoke of. She and Warren had gone with Richard to get him through the shield that kept him bound to the palace. After they passed through the shield, they went to the Bakaban Mana people and took them all to the Valley of the Lost, their ancestral homeland, a homeland they had been driven from 3,000 years before in order that the towers that separated the old and the new world be put up. Richard needed their spirit woman to help him. Richard had used unimaginable power, not only additive magic but subtractive too, to destroy the towers and cleanse the valley, returning it to the Bakaman Mana before he went on his desperate mission to stop the Keeper of the Dead from escaping through the gateway and into the world of the living. Winter solstice had come and gone, so she knew he had succeeded. Suddenly, Verna turned to Millie. That was almost a month ago. Well before she died, Millie nodded. That seems about right to me. You mean to say that she gave you the ring almost three weeks before she died? Millie nodded. Why so long? She said she wanted to give it to me before she slipped any further and wouldn't be able to say goodbye to me or be able to give proper instructions. I see. And when you went back after that, before she died, did she slip as she thought? Millie shrugged as she let out a sigh. That was the only time I saw her. When I went back to see her and to clean, the guard said that Nathan and the prelate had left strict orders that no one was to be allowed in. Something about Nathan not being disturbed as he tried his best to heal her. I didn't want him to fail, so I tiptoed away quiet as I could. Verna sighed. 
Well, thank you for telling me, Millie. Verna glanced at her desk and the waiting stacks of reports. I'd best be back at my work, too, or everyone will think me lazy. Oh, that's a shame, Prelate. Such a warm, beautiful night, you should enjoy your private garden. Verna grunted. I've so much work to do, I've never even poked my nose out to look at the Prelate's private garden. Millie started toward her bucket, but suddenly spun back. Prelate, I just remembered something else that Anne told me. Verna straightened her dress at her shoulders. She told you something else? Something you told the others that you forgot to tell me? No, Prelate, Millie whispered as she scurried closer. No, she told me and told me to tell none but the new Prelate. For some reason, it's been completely out of my memory until this moment. With all the rest, she may have spelled the message to make you forget it for all but the new Prelate. That could be, Millie said as she rubbed her lip. She looked into Verna's eyes. Anne would do things like that sometimes. Sometimes she could be devious. Verna smiled without humor. Yes, I know. I, too, have been on the receiving end of her manipulations. What is the message? She said to tell you to be sure not to work too hard. Verna rested a hand on a hip. That's the message? Millie nodded as she leaned close and lowered her voice. And she said that you should use the garden to relax. But she took my arm and pulled me close then, looking right into my eyes, and told me to tell you also to be sure to visit the prelate's sanctuary. Sanctuary? What sanctuary? Millie turned and pointed through the open doors. Out in the garden, there's a little building nestled in the trees and shrubs. She called it her sanctuary. I've never been in it. She never allowed me to go in there to clean. She cleaned it herself, she said, because a sanctuary was a sacrosanct place where a body could be alone and where no one else ever set foot. She would go there from time to time, I think, to pray for guidance from the Creator, or perhaps just to be alone. She said to be sure to tell you to go there and visit it. Verna let out an exasperated breath. Sounds like her way of telling me I would need the Creator's help to get through all the paperwork. She did have a twisted sense of humor sometimes, Millie chuckled. Yes, Prelate, that she did, twisted. Millie put her hands to her blushing cheeks. May the Creator forgive me. She was a kind woman. Her humor was never meant to be hurtful. No, I suppose not. Verna rubbed her temples as she started for her desk. She was tired and dreaded the prospect of reading more mind-numbing reports. She halted and turned back to Millie. The doors to the garden were opened wide, letting in the fresh night air. Millie, it's late. Why don't you go have some dinner and get some rest? Rest is good for tired bones, Millie grinned. Really, Prelate? You don't mind your office being layered in dirt? Verna laughed under her breath. Millie, I've been out of doors for so many years that I've grown fond of dirt. It's fine, really. Have a good rest. As Verna stood in the doorway to her garden, looking out into the night, that moonlight dappled ground beneath trees and vines, Millie gathered up her rags and bucket. A good night to you then, Prelate. Enjoy your visit to your garden. She heard the door close and the room fall silent. She stood feeling the warm, moist breeze and inhaled the fragrant aroma of leaf and flower and earth. Verna took a last look back at her office and then stepped out into the waiting night. Chapter 22 Verna took a deep, refreshing breath of the humid night air. It was like a tonic. She could feel her muscles relaxing as she strolled down a winding, narrow path among beds of peeping lilies, flowering dogwood, and lush huckleberry bushes as she waited for her eyes to adjust to the moonlight. Spreading trees reached over the dense shrubs, seeming to offer their branches for her to touch, or the sweet fragrance of their foliage and blossoms for her to inhale. Though it was too early for most trees to be in bloom, in the prelate's garden there were a few rare ever-blossoms, squat, gnarled, outspreading trees that bloomed throughout the year, though they fruited only in season. In the New World, she had come across a small forest of ever-blossoms and discovered them to be a favorite haunt of the elusive night wisps, frail creatures appearing to be nothing more than sparks of light and only visible at night. After the night wisps had been convinced of their benign intentions, she and the two sisters she had been with at the time had spent several nights there, talking with the wisps of simple things and learning about the benevolent nature of the wizards and confessors who guided the alliance of the Midlands. Verna had been pleased to learn that the people of the Midlands protected places of magic and left the creatures inhabiting them to live their lives in unmolested solitude. 
While there were wild places in the old world where magic creatures dwelled, they were nowhere near as numerous or as varied as those wonderful places in the new world. Verna had learned a bit of tolerance from some of those creatures, that the Creator had sprinkled the world with many fragile wonders, and sometimes mankind's highest calling was to simply let them be. In the old world, that view was not widely held, and there were many places where wild magic had been brought under control lest people be injured or killed by things not amenable to reason. Magic could often be inconvenient. In many ways, the new world was still a wild place, as the old world had been thousands of years ago, before man made it a safe, if somewhat sterile, place through its notions of stewardship. Verna missed the new world. She had never felt so at home as she did there. Ducks sleeping with their heads tucked back under their wings bobbed at the edge of a pond beside the path, while unseen frogs croaked from the reeds. Verna saw an occasional flutter mouse swoop down across the surface of the water to snatch a bug from the air. Moon shadows played across the grassy bank as the gentle breeze caressed the trees overhead. Just beyond the pond, a small side trail turned off toward a stand of trees among a thicket of underbrush hardly touched by the moonlight. Verna somehow felt this was the place she sought and strolled off the main path toward the waiting shadows. The grounds here seemed to be ruled by the wildness of nature as opposed to the cultured look of much of the garden. Through a narrow opening in the wall of Thorn Grove, Verna found an enchanting little stuccoed building with four gables, the rake of each tiled roof swooping down in a gentle curve to eaves no higher than her head. A towering maidenhair tree stood off the face of each gable, its branches lacing together overhead. Sweet briar hugged the ground close to the walls, suffusing the cozy enclosure with a fragrant scent. A round window, too high to see through, was set in the peak of each gable. At one gabled wall, where the path ended, Verna found a rough-hewn, round-topped door with a sunburst pattern carved in its center. There was a pull handle, but no lock. A tug produced no movement, not even a wiggle. The door was shielded. Verna ran her fingers along the edge, feeling for the nature of the shield or its keyway. She felt only an icy chill that made her recoil at its touch. She opened herself to her Han, letting the sweet light inundate her with its warm, familiar comfort. She nearly gasped with the glory of being just that much closer to the Creator. The air suddenly smelled of a thousand scents. Against her flesh it felt of moisture, dust, pollen, and salt from the ocean. In her ears it carried the sounds of a world of insects, small animals, and fragments of words carried for miles in its airy, volatile fingers. She listened carefully for any sounds that might betray anyone near, at least anyone with no more than additive magic. She heard none. Verna focused her Han on the door before her. Her probe told her that the entire building was encased in a web, but not one she had ever felt before. It had elements of ice woven through with spirit. She didn't even know ice could be woven with spirit. The two fought each other like cats in a sack, but there it was, the two of them purring contentedly as if they belonged together. She had absolutely no idea how such a shield could be breached, much less undone. Still joined with her Han, an impulse came to her, and she reached up, touching the sunburst pattern on her ring to that on the door. The door swung silently open. Verna stepped inside and placed the ring on the sunburst pattern carved on the inside of the door. It obediently swung closed. With her Han, she could feel the shield sealed tight around her. Verna had never felt so isolated, so alone, so safe. Candles sprang to flame. She surmised that they must be tied to the shield. The light from the ten candles, five each in two candlesticks with branching arms, was more than sufficient to light the inside of the small sanctuary. The candlesticks stood to each side of a small altar draped with a white cloth trimmed in gold thread. Atop the white cloth rested a perforated bowl, probably for burning aromatic gums. A red brocade kneeling pad edged with gold tassels sat on the floor before the altar. Each of the four alcoves formed by the gables was only large enough for the comfortable-looking chair occupying one of them. One of the others held the altar, another a tiny table with a three-legged stool, and the last, along with the door, a box bench with a neatly folded quilted comforter, probably for the lap, as lying down looked to be out of the question. The area in the center wasn't much larger than the alcoves. Verna turned about 
wondering what it was she was supposed to do here. Prelate Annalena had left a message to make sure she visited the place, but why? What was she to accomplish here? She flopped down in the chair, her eyes searching the faceted walls that followed the in and out of the gable ends. Maybe she was supposed to come here to relax. Annalena knew the work of being prelate. Maybe she simply wanted her successor to know of a place where she could be alone, a place to get away from people always bringing her reports. Verna drummed her fingers on the arm of the chair. Not likely. She didn't feel like sitting. There were more important things to do. There were reports waiting, and they were hardly likely to begin reading themselves. Hands clasped behind her back, Verna paced as best she could around the tiny room. This was certainly a waste of time. She finally let out an exasperated breath and lifted her fist toward the door, but stopped before she touched the ring to the sunburst pattern. Verna turned back, staring for a moment, then lifted her skirts and knelt on the pad. Perhaps Annalena wanted her to pray for guidance. A prelate was expected to be a pious person, although it was absurd to think one needed a special place to pray to the Creator. The Creator had created everything. Everywhere was his special place. So why would one need a special place to seek guidance? A special place could never approach the meaningfulness of one's own heart. No place could compare to joining with her Han. With an irritated sigh, Verna folded her hands. She waited, but wasn't in the mood to pray to the Creator in a place in which she was under obligation to do so. It vexed her to think that Annalena was dead, yet still manipulated her. Verna's eyes roved the bare walls as her toe tapped against the floor. That woman was reaching out from the world beyond to enjoy a final morsel of control. Hadn't she had enough of that in all the years she was prelate? One would think that would be enough, but no, she had to have it all planned out so that even after she was dead, she could still... Verna's eyes settled on the bowl. There was something in the bottom, and it wasn't ashes. She reached in and lifted out a small package wrapped in paper and tied with a bit of string. She turned it over in her fingers, inspecting it. This had to be it. This had to be what she was sent here for. But why leave it in here? The shield. No one but the prelate could enter. This was the only place to put something if you didn't want anyone but the prelate to have it. Verna pulled the ends of the bow and dropped the string back in the bowl. Laying it in a palm, she lifted back the paper and stared at what was inside. It was a journey book. Finally, movement returned to her fingers, and she extracted the book from the paper to thumb through the pages. Blank. Journey books were objects of magic, like the Dakra, that had been created by the same wizards who had invested the Palace of the Prophets with both additive and subtractive magic. None since, for three thousand years except Richard, had been born with subtractive. Some had learned it through the calling, but none but Richard had been born with it. Journey books had the ability to transmit messages. What was written in one with the stylus stored in the spine would appear by magic in its twin. As near as they could determine, the message written in one appeared in the twin simultaneously. Since the stylus could also be used to wipe old messages away, the books were never used up and could be used over and over. They had been carried by sisters who went on journeys to recover boys born with the gift. More often than not, the sisters had had to travel through the barrier, through the Valley of the Lost, going into the New World to recover the boy and put a Radahan around his neck so that the gift would not harm him while he learned to control his magic. Once beyond the barrier, there was no turning back for instructions or guidance. One journey through and back was all that was possible for each sister. Until now. Richard had destroyed the towers and their storms of spells. A young boy with no understanding of the gift could not control it, and his magic sent out telltale signs that could be detected by sisters at the palace who were sensitive to such disturbances in the flows of power. Not enough sisters had this talent to risk sending them on journeys, so others were sent, and they carried a journey book to be able to communicate with the palace. If sisters were to go after the boy and something happened, he moved, for example, they would need guidance to find him in his new location. Of course, a wizard could teach the boy to control the gift in order to avoid its many dangers, and in fact that was the preferred method. But wizards were not always available or willing. The sisters had long ago established an accord with the wizards in the New World. In the absence of a wizard, 
The Sisters of the Light were allowed to save a boy's life by taking him to the Palace of the Prophets for training in the use of his gift. For their part, the sisters had vowed never to take a boy who had a wizard willing to teach him. It was a truce backed by a death sentence to any sister who ever again entered the new world if the agreement were ever violated. Prelate Annalena had violated that agreement in order to bring Richard to the palace. Verna had been the unwitting instrument of the violation. At any one time, there could be several sisters gone on a journey to recover a boy. Verna had found a whole box of journey books back in her office tied together in matching pairs. The journey books were twinned, each working only with its correct twin. Precautions were always taken before a journey was undertaken. The two books were taken to separate locations and tested, just to be sure a sister wasn't sent off with the wrong book. Journeys were dangerous. That was why the sisters also carried a dakra up their sleeve. Usually a journey lasted a few months, and on rare occasions they had lasted as long as a year. Verna's journey had lasted over 20 years. Nothing like that had ever happened before, but then it had been 3,000 years since one like Richard had been born. Verna had lost 20 years she could never recover. She had aged in the outside world. The 20-odd years of aging her body had undergone would have taken near to 300 years at the Palace of the Prophets. She had not simply given up 20 years to go on Prelate Annalena's mission. She had, in reality, given up close to 300 years. Worse, Annalena had known all along where Richard was. Even though she had done as she had in order to allow the proper prophecies to come to pass so they could stop the keeper, it hurt that she had never told Verna that she was being sent out to throw away that much of her life as a decoy. Verna reprimanded herself. She had not thrown anything away. She had been doing the Creator's work. Just because she hadn't known all the facts at the time made it no less important. Many people toiled their whole lives at meaningless things. Verna had toiled at something that had saved the world of the living. Besides that, those 20 years were perhaps the best years of her life. She had been out in the world on her own with two other Sisters of the Light, learning about strange places and strange peoples. She had slept under the stars, seen distant mountains, plains, rivers, rolling hills, villages, towns, and cities that few others had seen. She had made her own decisions and accepted the consequences. She had never had to read reports. She had lived the stuff of reports. No, she had not lost anything. She had gained more than any of the sisters sitting back here for 300 years would ever gain. Verna felt a tear drop onto her hand. She reached up and wiped her cheek. She missed her journey. All that time she had thought she hated it, and only now did she realize how much it meant to her. She turned the journey book over in her trembling fingers, feeling the familiar size and weight, the familiar grain of the leather, the familiar three little bumps at the top of the front cover. She jerked the book open to her eyes, looking in the candlelight. The three bumps, the deep scratch at the bottom of the spine, it was the same book. She couldn't mistake her journey book, not after carrying it for 20 years. It was the very same book. She had looked at all the books in the box in her office, absently searching for this one, and she had not found it. It had been here. But why? She held up the paper it had been wrapped in and saw there was writing on the paper. She held it near the candle in order to read it. Guard this with your life. She turned the paper over, but that was all it said. Guard this with your life. Verna knew the prelate's hand. When she had been on her journey to recover Richard, and after she had found him but was forbidden to interfere with him in any way, or to use his collar to help control him, yet was expected to bring him back a grown man unlike any other they had ever recovered, she had sent an angry message to the palace. I am the sister in charge of this boy. These directives are beyond reason, if not absurd. I demand to know the meaning of these instructions. I demand to know upon whose authority they are given. She had received back a message. You will do as you are instructed or suffer the consequences. Do not presume to question the orders of the palace again. In my own hand, the prelate. The message of reprimand the prelate had sent her was burned in her memory. The handwriting was engraved in her memory. The hand on the piece of paper was the same. That message had been a thorn in her side, forbidding her to do the very things she had been trained to do. It was only back at the palace that she discovered that Richard had subtractive magic, and had she used the collar, he would have very well likely killed her. The prelate had been saving her life, 
but it nettled her that once again she had not been informed. Verna guessed that was what annoyed her the most, the prelate not telling her why. She understood, of course. There had been sisters of the dark at the palace, and the prelate could not take any risk, or the whole world would be consumed. But emotionally, it still vexed her. Reason and passion were not always in agreement. As prelate, she was coming to see that sometimes you couldn't convince people of the need of something, and the only option was simply to give an order. Sometimes you had to use people to do what must be done. Verna dropped the paper in the bowl and ignited it with a flow of Han. She watched it burn just to be sure it was entirely reduced to ash. Verna squeezed the journey book, her journey book, tightly in her hand. It was good to have it back. Of course, it wasn't really hers, it belonged to the palace, but she had carried it so many years that it felt like hers, like an old familiar friend. The thought struck her abruptly. Where was the other one? This book had a twin. Where was its twin? Who had it? She regarded the book with sudden trepidation. She was holding something potentially dangerous, and once again, Annalena was not telling her all of it. It was entirely possible that its twin was held by a sister of the dark. This could be Annalena's way of telling her to find its twin, and she would find a sister of the dark. But how? She couldn't simply write, who are you and where are you in the book. Verna kissed her ring finger, her ring, and then stood. Guard this with your life. Journeys were dangerous. Sisters had been captured, and on occasion killed by hostile peoples who were protected by magic of their own. In those instances, only her dakra, a knife-like weapon with the ability to instantly extinguish life, could protect her if she were quick enough. Verna still had hers up her sleeve. On the back of her belt, Verna had long ago sewn a pouch to secret the journey book and keep it safe. She slipped the little book into its glove-like pouch. Verna patted her belt. It felt good to have the journey book back there. Guard this with your life. Dear Creator, who had the other? When Verna burst through the door to her outer office, Sister Phoebe jumped up as if someone had stuck her in the rump with a sharp stick. Her round face went red. Prelate, you startled me. You weren't in your office. I thought you had gone to bed. Verna's gaze swept the desk scattered with reports. I thought I told you that you had done enough work for one day and to go get some rest. Phoebe twisted her fingers together as she winced. You did, but I remembered some tallies I had forgotten to verify, and I was afraid you would see them and call me to account, so I ran back to check the numbers. Verna had somewhere to go, but rethought how she had planned to go about it. She clasped her hands. Phoebe, how would you like to do a task that Prelate Annalena always trusted to her administrators? Sister Phoebe's fingers stilled. Really? What is it? Verna gestured back toward her office. I've been out of my garden praying for guidance, and it has come to me that in these trying times I should consult the prophecies. Whenever Prelate Annalena did the same, she always had her administrators clear the vaults so that she wouldn't feel encumbered by prying eyes watching what she read. How would you like to order the vaults cleared for me like her administrators did for her? The young woman bounced on the balls of her feet. Really, Verna? That would be splendid. Young woman indeed, Verna thought in annoyance. They were the same age, even if they didn't look it. Let's be off then. I have palace business to attend to. Sister Phoebe snatched up her white shawl, throwing it over her shoulders as she bolted through the door. Phoebe, the round face peeked back around the doorframe. If Warren is in the vaults, have him stay. I have a few questions, and he would be better able to direct me to the proper volumes than any of the others would. It will save me time. All right, Verna. Phoebe said in a breathless voice. She liked doing paperwork, probably because it made her feel useful in a way she never would have until she had another hundred years of experience. But Verna had cut that time short by appointing her the prelate's administrator. The prospect of wielding orders, though, seemed to be of even more interest than paperwork. I'll run ahead and have them cleared by the time you get there, she grinned. I'm glad it was me here instead of Dulcinea. Verna remembered how she and Phoebe used to be of such like personalities. Verna wondered if she really had such an immature temperament when Annalena had sent her on her journey. It seemed to her that in the years she had been gone, she had grown older than Phoebe in more than just appearance. Perhaps she had simply learned more out in the world, rather than in the cloistered life of the Palace of the Prophets. Verna smiled. Almost seems like one of our old pranks, doesn't it? 
Phoebe giggled. Sure does, Verna. Except it won't end in us stringing a thousand prayer beads. She dashed off down the hall, her skirts and shawl flapping behind. By the time Verna had made it down into the heart of the palace to the huge, round, six-foot-thick stone door leading into vaults carved from the bedrock atop which sat the palace, Phoebe was just leading six sisters, two novices, and three young men out. Novices and young men were given lessons at all hours of the day and night. Sometimes they were even awakened in the dead of night for lessons, such as ones down in the vaults. The creator didn't keep hours. They were expected to learn that in his work they didn't die there. They all bowed as one. The creator's blessing on you, Verna said to them as a group. She was about to apologize for chasing them from the vaults when they were busy, but she cut herself off, reminding herself that she was the prelate and didn't need to make excuses to anyone. The prelate's word was law and was followed without question. Still, it was hard not to explain herself. All clear, prelate, Sister Phoebe said in an august tone. Phoebe inclined her head toward the room beyond. Except the one you asked to see. He's in one of the small rooms. Verna nodded to her assistant and then turned her attention to the novices who were in a state of wide-eyed awe. And how are your studies coming? Trembling like leaves on a quaking aspen, both girls curtsied, one swallowed. Very well, prelate, she squeaked, her face going red. Verna remembered the first time the prelate had addressed her directly. It had seemed as if the creator himself had spoken. She remembered how much the prelate's smile had meant to her, how it had sustained and inspired her. Verna squatted down, and in each arm hugged a girl to herself. She kissed each forehead. If you ever have a need, don't be afraid to come to me. That's what I'm here for. And I love you like all the creator's children. Both girls beamed and performed curtsies more steady the second time. Their round eyes stared at the gold ring on her finger. As if it had reminded them, they each kissed their own ring finger, whispering a prayer to the creator. Verna did the same. Their eyes widened at the sight. She held her hand out. Would you like to kiss the ring that symbolizes the light we all follow? They nodded earnestly, going to a knee in turns to kiss the sunburst patterned ring. Verna squeezed each small shoulder. What are your names? Helen Prelate, one said. Valerie Prelate, the other said. Helen and Valerie. Verna didn't need to remind herself to smile. Remember, novices Helen and Valerie that while there are others, such as the sisters, who know more than you and will teach you many things, there is no one closer to the Creator than you, not even me. We are all his children. Verna felt more than a little uncomfortable being the object of veneration, but she smiled and waved as the group headed off down the stone hall. After they had rounded a corner, Verna pressed her hand to the cold metal plate set in the wall, the plate that was the keyway to the shield guarding the vaults. The ground shook beneath her feet as the huge round door began to move. It was rare for the main vault door to be closed, except under special circumstances. Only the prelate ever sealed the entrance. She stepped into the vault as the door grated closed behind her, leaving her in tomb-like silence. Verna passed the old worn tables with papers scattered all over them, along with some of the simpler books of prophecy. The sisters had been giving lessons, the lamps set about the carved stone walls did little to diminish a feeling of perpetual night. Long rows of bookcases stretched off to either side among massive pillars supporting the vaulted ceiling. Warren was in one of the back rooms. The small hollowed-out alcoves were restricted and so had separate doors and shields. The room he was in was one with the oldest prophecies written in Haida Haran. Few people knew Haida Haran, among them Warren and Verna's predecessor. When she stepped into the lamplight, Warren, slouched against the table with his arms folded atop it, only glanced up. Phoebe told me you wanted to use the vaults, he said in a distracted voice. Warren, I need to talk to you. Something has happened. He flipped a page in the book before him. He didn't look up. Yes, all right. She frowned and then drew a chair to the table beside him but didn't sit. With a flick of her wrist, Verna brought a dakra to her left hand. The dakra with a silver rod in place of a blade, was used the same as a knife, but it wasn't the wound it caused that killed. The Dakara was a weapon possessing ancient magic. Used in conjunction with the wielder's Han, it drained the life force from the victim, regardless of the nature of the wound. There was no defense against its magic. Warren looked up with tired red eyes as she leaned closer. 
Warren, I want you to have this. That's a weapon of the sisters. You have the gift. It will work for you as well as me. What do you want me to do with it? Protect yourself. He frowned. What do you mean? The sisters of the... She glanced back into the main room. Even if it was empty, there was no telling how far one with subtractive magic could hear. They had heard Prelate Annalena name them. You know, she lowered her voice. Warren, though you have the gift, it will not protect you against them. This will. There is no protection against this. None. She spun the weapon in her hand with practiced grace, walking it over the backs of her fingers as it twirled. The dull silver color was a blur in the lamplight. She caught the rod-like blade and held the handle out to him. I found extras in my office. I want you to have one. He flipped his hand dismissively. I don't know how to handle that thing. I only know how to read the old books. Verna snatched his violet robes at his neck and drew his face close. You just stick it in them. Belly, chest, back, neck, arm, hand, foot, it doesn't matter. Just stick them while you're shrouded in your Han, and they will be dead before you can blink. My sleeves aren't tight like yours. It will just fall out. Warren, the doctor doesn't know where you keep it or care. Sisters practice for hours on end and carry them in our sleeves so they will be readily at hand. We do that for protection when we go on journeys. It doesn't matter where you carry it, only that you do. Keep it in a pocket if you wish. Just don't sit on it. With a sigh, he took the dakra. If it will make you happy, but I don't think I could stab anyone. She released his robes as she looked away. You would be surprised what you can do when you have to. Is this what you came for? You found an extra dakra? No. She drew the little book from its pouch behind her belt and tossed it on the table before him. I came because of this. He glanced at her out of the corner of his eye. Going somewhere, Verna? Scowling, she smacked his shoulder. What's the matter with you? He pushed the book away. I'm just tired. What's so important about a journey book? She lowered her voice. Prelate Annalena left a message that I should go to her private sanctuary in her garden. It was shielded with a web of ice and spirit. Warren lifted an eyebrow. She showed him a ring. This opens it. Inside, I found this journey book. It was wrapped in a piece of paper that said only, guard this with your life. Warren picked up the journey book and thumbed through the blank pages. She probably just wants to send you instructions. She's dead. Warren cocked an eyebrow. Do you think that would stop her? Verna smiled in spite of herself. Maybe you're right. Maybe we burned the other with her, and she intended to run my life from the world of the dead. Warren's expression slipped back to sullen. So who has the other one? Verna smoothed her dress behind her knees and sat, scooting the chair closer. I don't know. I'm worried that it could be a telltale of sorts. She might have meant it to mean that if I discovered the other, it would identify our enemy. Warren's smooth brow wrinkled up. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you think that? I don't know, Warren. Verna wiped a hand across her face. It was the only thing I could think of. Can you think of anything that would make more sense? Why else would she not tell me who had the other? If it was someone meant to help us, someone on our side, then it would only make sense for her to have told me the name, or at least that it was a friend who had the other. Warren returned his stare to the table. I suppose. Verna checked her tone before she spoke. Warren, what's wrong? I've never seen you like this before. She shared a long look with his troubled eyes. I've read some prophecies I don't like. Verna searched his face. What did they say? After a long pause, he reached down and with two fingers turned a piece of paper around and pushed it toward her. Finally, she picked it up and read it aloud. When the prelate and the prophet are given to the light in the sacred rite, the flames will bring to boil a cauldron of guile and give ascension to a false prelate who will reign over the death of the palace of the prophets. To the north, the one bonded to the blade will abandon it for the silver sliff, for he will breathe her back to life and she will deliver him into the arms of the wicked. Verna swallowed, afraid to meet Warren's eyes. She set the paper on the table and folded her hands in her lap to stop their trembling. She sat silently staring down, not knowing what to say. This is a prophecy on a true fork, Warren said at last. That's an audacious statement, Warren, even for one as talented with prophecies as you. How old is this prophecy? Not yet a day. Her wide eyes came up. 
What? She whispered. Warren, are you saying that... that it came to you? That you have at last given a prophecy? Warren's red eyes stared back. Yes. I went into a kind of trance, and in this state of rapture, I had a vision of fragments of this prophecy, along with the words. That was the way it happened for Nathan, too, I believe. Remember that I told you I was beginning to understand prophecy in a way I never had before? It's through the visions that the prophecies are truly meant to be revealed. Verna swept her hand around. But the book holds prophecies, not visions. The words prophesy. The words are only a way to pass them down, and only meant to be clues that trip the vision in one who has the gift for prophecy. All the studying the sisters have done for the last 3,000 years is only a partial understanding of them. The written words were meant to pass knowledge to wizards through the visions. That's what I learned when this one came to me. It was like a door opening in my mind. All this time, and the key was right inside my own head. You mean you can read any of these and have a vision that will reveal its true meaning? He shook his head. I'm a child who has taken his first step. I have a long way to go before I'll be vaulting over fences. She looked at the page on the table and then glanced away as she twisted the ring around and around on her finger. And does this one, the one that came to you, mean what it sounds like? Warren licked his lips. Like an infant's first step, which is not very steady, this is not the most stable of prophecies. You might say it's sort of a practice prophecy. I've found others that I think are the same sort of first attempts. Like this one here, Warren, is it true or not? He tugged his sleeves down his arms. It's all true. But the words, as in all prophecies, while true, are not necessarily what they would seem. Verna leaned close as she gritted her teeth. Answer the question, Warren. We're in this together, I have to know. He flipped his hand, as he often did when trying to diminish the importance of something. To Verna, though, that flip of a hand was like a flag of warning. Look, Verna, I'll tell you what I know, what I saw in the vision, but I'm new at this, and I don't understand it all, even though it's my prophecy. She kept a steady glare on him. Tell me, Warren. The prelate in the prophecy is not you. I don't know who it is, but it isn't you. Verna closed her eyes as she sighed. Warren, that's not as bad as I thought. At least it's not to be me who does this terrible thing. We can work to turn this prophecy to a false fork. Warren looked away. He stuffed the paper with his prophecy into an open book and flopped it closed. Verna... For someone else to be prelate, that has to mean you will be dead. Chapter 23 When his whole body suddenly flushed with the sweet agony of desire, he knew, even though he couldn't see her, that she had entered the room. His nostrils filled with her unmistakable scent, and already he ached to surrender. Like a furtive movement in the mist, he couldn't discern the essence of the threat, but somehow in the dim recesses of his awareness, he knew without doubt that there was one, and the exquisite peril, too, excited him. With the desperation of a man being stormed by an overpowering foe, he clawed for the hilt of his sword, hoping to rally his resolve and stay the hand of submission. It wasn't bared steel he sought, though, but the bared teeth of anger, a rage that would sustain him and give him the will to resist. He could do it. He had to. Everything turned on this. His hand anchored on the hilt at his belt, and he felt the flood of perfect fury coursing through his body and mind. When Richard glanced up, he could see the approach of Ulick and Egan's heads above the knot of people before him. Even if he hadn't seen them, to see the space between them where she would be, he knew she was there. Soldiers and dignitaries began parting to make way for the two big men and their charge. Heads tilted in waves, reminding him of the rings of ripples in a pond, as they passed whispers to others. Richard recalled that the prophecies had also named him the pebble in the pond, the generator of ripples in the world of life. And then he saw her. His chest constricted with longing. She was wearing the same rose-colored silk dress that she had worn the night before, having no change of clothes with her. Richard recalled vividly how she had said she slept naked. He could feel his heart hammering. With great effort, he struggled to put his mind to the task at hand. He looked with wide eyes at the soldiers she knew. They were her Celtish palace guard, 
Now they wore Daharan uniforms. Richard had been up early, preparing everything. He hadn't been able to get much sleep anyway, and the sleep he had gotten had been racked with dreams of longing. Kalin, my love, can you ever forgive me my dreams? With this many Daharan troops in Adendril, he had known there would be supplies of all sorts available. So he had ordered spare uniforms brought out. The Keltons, being disarmed as they were, were in no position to argue. But after they had put on the dark leather and mail, and had had a chance to see how fierce they looked in the new outfits, they began to grin with approval. They were told that Kelton was now a part of Dahara, and were given back their weapons. They stood in rank now, proud and straight, as they kept an eye on the representatives of the other lands who had yet to surrender. As it had turned out, the bad luck of the storm that had allowed Brogan to escape had also carried good fortune as a balance. The dignitaries had wanted to wait out the foul weather before departing. So Richard had taken what the fates had offered him and had brought them back to the palace before they were to leave later that morning. Only the highest, the most important of those officials were present. He wanted them to witness the surrender of Kelton, one of the most powerful lands of the Midlands. He wanted them to have one final lesson. Richard stood as Catherine started up the steps at the side of the dais, her gaze sweeping the faces watching her. Berdine stepped back to give her room. Richard had positioned the three moored Sith at the far ends of the platform where they wouldn't be too close to him. He wasn't interested in anything they might have to say. When Catherine's brown-eyed gaze finally settled on him, he had to lock his knees to keep his legs from buckling. His left hand, gripping the hilt of his sword, was beginning to throb. He reminded himself that he didn't need to be holding the sword to command its magic and chanced removing his hand to wiggle some feeling back into his fingers while he contemplated the tasks before him. When the Sisters of the Light had tried to teach him to touch his Han, they had him use a mental picture to concentrate his inner will. Richard had selected an image of the Sword of Truth to be his focus, and he had it firmly fixed in his mind now. But for the battle with the people gathered before him today, the sword would be of no use. Today he would need the deft maneuvers devised with the aid of General Rybish, his officers, and knowledgeable members of the palace staff who had also helped with the arrangements. He hoped he had it all right. Richard, what? Welcome, Duchess. Everything has been prepared. Richard scooped up her hand and kissed it in a manner he judged befitting a queen being greeted before an audience, but touching her only fired his heat. I knew you would want these representatives to witness your bravery at being the first to join with us against the Imperial Order, the first to break the path for the Midlands. But I... Well, yes, of course. He turned to the watching faces. They were a considerably more quiet and compliant group than they had been the last time, as they waited in tense anticipation. Duchess Lumholtz, whom you all know is soon to be named Queen of Kelton, has committed her people to the cause of freedom and wished you to be here to witness as she signs the documents of surrender. Richard, she whispered as she leaned a little closer, I must... Have them looked over by our barristers first, just to be sure everything is clear, and there will be no misunderstandings. Richard smiled reassuringly. Though I'm sure you will find them quite clear, I've already anticipated your concern and took the liberty of inviting them to the signing. Richard held a hand out to the other end of the dais. Raina seized a man's arm and urged him up the steps. Master Seifold, would you give your future queen your professional opinion? He bowed. As Lord Rawl says, Duchess, the papers are quite clear. There is no room for misinterpretation. Richard lifted the ornately decorated document from the desk. With your permission, Duchess, I would like to read it to the gathered representatives so they may see that Kelton wishes this joining of our forces to be unequivocal, so they may see your bravery. Her head rose with pride before the eyes of the representatives of the other lands. Yes, please do, Lord Rawl. Richard glanced to the waiting faces. Please bear with me, this isn't long. He held the paper up before himself and read it aloud. Know all peoples that Kelton hereby surrenders unconditionally to Dahara, signed in my hand as the duly appointed leader of the Keltish people, the Duchess Lumholtz. Richard set the document back on the desk and dunked the quill pen in a bottle of ink before offering it to Catherine. She stood stiff and unmoving. Her face had gone ashen. Fearing she would balk, he had no choice. 
Summoning strength he knew he was stealing from what he would need later, he put his lips close to her ear, enduring silently the torturous wave of longing at the warm fragrance of her flesh. Catherine, after we finish here, would you go for a walk with me, just the two of us alone? I dreamed of nothing but you. Radiant color bloomed in her cheeks. He thought she might put an arm around his neck and thanked the spirits when she didn't. Of course, Richard, she whispered back. I too dreamed of nothing but you. Let's get this formality over with. Make me proud of you, of your strength. Richard thought that surely her smile would make others in the room blush. He could feel his ears burn at the meaning her smile conveyed. She took the quill pen, brushing his hand as she did so, and held it up. I sign this surrender with a quill from a dove to signify that what I do is done willingly, in peace, and not as one defeated. I do it out of love for my people and a hope for the future. That hope is this man here, Lord Rao. I swear the undying vengeance of my people on any of you who would think to harm him. She bent and scrawled her sweeping signature across the bottom of the surrender document. Before she could straighten, Richard produced more papers and slid them under her. What? The letters you spoke of, Duchess. I didn't want to weigh you down with the tedium of having to do the work yourself when we could put the time to a better purpose. Your aides helped me draw them up. Please check them, just to be sure all is as you intended when you made the offer last night. Lieutenant Harrington of your palace guard helped with the names of General Baldwin, commander of all Keltish forces, Division Generals Cutter, Bladen, Nesbitt, Bradford, and Emerson, and a few of the guard commanders. There's a letter to each for you to sign, ordering them to turn over all command to my Daharan officers. Some of your palace guard officers will accompany a detachment of my men along with the new officers. Your adjutant aide, Master Montleon, has been of invaluable assistance with the instructions to Finance Minister Pelletier, Master Carlyle, the Deputy Administrator of Strategic Planning, the governors in charge of the Trade Commission, Cameron, Tuck, Spooner, Ashmore, as well as Leverdson, Dudier, and Falkingham of the Office of Commerce. Co-adjutant Schaffer, of course, drew up the list of your mayors. We didn't want to offend anyone by leaving them out, of course, so he had several aides help him work up a complete list. There are letters here for them all, but of course the letters of instruction are the same, with just the proper name to each, so you only have to check over one and then just sign the rest. We'll handle it from there. I have men ready to ride with the official document pouches. A man from your guard will accompany each, just to make sure there's no confusion. We have all the men from your guard here to witness your signature. Richard drew a breath and straightened as Catherine, still holding the pen in midair, blinked at all the papers Richard had pushed before her. Her aides had all come up to surround her, proud of the job they had accomplished in such short order. Richard leaned close to her again. I hope I got it all as you wished, Catherine. You said you'd take care of it, but I didn't want to be away from you while you toiled at the work, so I rose early and took care of it for you. I hope you're pleased. She glanced over letters, pushing them aside to look at others underneath. Yes, of course. Richard slid a chair closer. Why don't you have a seat? When she had sat and started signing her name, Richard pushed his sword out of the way and sat beside her in the mother confessor's chair. He settled his gaze on the people watching and kept it there as he listened to the pen scratching. He kept the rage on a slow boil in order to concentrate. Richard turned back to the smiling Celtic officials behind and to each side of her chair. You've all performed a valuable service this morning, and I would be honored if you would be willing to continue in an official capacity. I'm sure I could use your talents in administering the growing Dahara. After they had all bowed and thanked him for his generosity, he once again turned his attention to the silent group watching the proceedings. The Daharan soldiers, especially the officers, having spent months stationed in Aidendril, had learned a great deal about trade in the Midlands. In the four days he had been with them searching for Brogan, Richard had learned all he could and had added to that knowledge earlier that morning. When he knew the questions to ask, Mistress Sanderholt had proven to be a woman of vast knowledge gathered over years of having prepared the dishes of many lands. Food, as it turned out, was a reservoir of knowledge about a people. Her keen ear didn't hurt either. Some of the papers the Duchess is signing are trade instructions, Richard told the officials as Catherine bent over her work. His eyes lingered on her shoulders. He willed them away. Since Kelton is now part of Dahara, you must understand there can be no trade between Kelton and those of you who have not joined with us. 
He turned his gaze on a short, round man with a curly black and gray beard. I realize, Representative Garthram, that this will put Liffany in an uncomfortable position. With Galia and Kelton's borders now ordered sealed to anyone not part of Dahara, you will have a very difficult time with trade. With Galia and Kelton to your north, Dahara to your east, and the Rongshada Mountains to the west, you will be hard pressed to find a source of iron. Most of what you purchased came from Kelton, and they bought grain from you. But Kelton will just have to buy their grain from the Galean warehouses now. Since they're now both Daharan, there is no longer any reason for past animosity to hinder trade, and their armies are under my command, so they won't be wasting effort worrying about one another, and instead will devote their attention to sealing the borders. Dahara, of course, has a use for Keltish iron and steel. I suggest you find another source and quickly, as the Imperial Order will probably attack from the south, possibly right through Liffany, I would suspect. I will have no man spilling blood to protect lands not yet joined with us, nor will I reward hesitation with trade privileges. Richard turned his gaze to a tall, gaunt man with a ring of wispy white hair around the base of his knobby skull. Ambassador Bezencourt. I regret to inform you that the letter here to Kelton's Commissioner Cameron instructs him that all agreements with your homeland of Sandaria are hereby cancelled until and unless you too are part of Dahara. When spring comes, Sandaria will not be allowed to drive their herds up from your plains to spring and summer on the highlands of Kelton. The tall man lost what little color he had to begin with. But Lord Roll, we have no place to spring and summer them. While those plains are a lush grassland in the winter, they are a brown and barren wasteland in the summer. What would you have us do? Richard shrugged. I would suppose you'll have to slaughter your herds in order to salvage what you can before they starve. The ambassador gasped. Lord Rawl, these agreements have been in place for centuries. Our whole economy is based on the husbandry of our sheep. Richard lifted an eyebrow. It's not my concern. My concern is with those who stand with us. Ambassador Bezencourt raised his hands in an imploring gesture. Lord Rawl, my people would be ruined. Our whole country would be devastated if we were forced to slaughter our herds. Representative Theriolt took an urgent step forward. You can't allow those herds to be slaughtered. Hirschborg depends on that wool. Why? Why, it would ruin our industry. Another spoke up. And then they couldn't trade with us, and we would have no way to buy crops that won't grow in our land. Richard leaned forward. Then I suggest you impress these arguments on your leaders and do your best to convince them that surrender is the only way. The sooner the better. He looked out at the other dignitaries. As interdependent as you all are, I'm sure you will soon come to realize the value of unity. Kelton is part of Dahara now. The trade routes will be closed to any who fail to stand with us. I told you before, there are no bystanders. A riot of protests, appeals, and supplications filled the council chambers. Richard stood and the voices fell to silence. The Sandarian ambassador lifted a bony finger in accusation. You are a ruthless man, Richard nodded, the magic heating his glare. Be sure to tell that to the Imperial Order if you choose to join with them. He looked down on the other faces. You all had peace and unity through the council and the mother confessor. While she was away fighting for you and your people, you threw that unity aside for ambition, for naked greed. You acted like children fighting over a cake. You had a chance to share it, but instead chose to try to steal it all from your smaller siblings. If you come to my table, you will have to mind your manners, but you each will have bread. No one offered an argument this time. Richard straightened his Mriswith cape on his shoulders when he realized Catherine had finished signing and was watching him with those big brown eyes. He couldn't maintain the grip on the sword's anger and the glow of her sweet gaze. He turned back to the representatives, the rage gone from his tone. The weather is clear. You had best be off. The sooner you convince your leaders to agree to my terms, the less inconvenience your people will suffer. I don't want anyone to suffer. His voice trailed off. Catherine stood next to him and looked down at the people she knew so well. Do as Lord Rall asks. He has given you enough of his time. She turned and addressed one of her aides. Have my clothes brought over at once. I'll be staying here at the Confessor's Palace. Why is she staying here? One of the ambassadors asked, as his brow wrinkled in suspicion. Her husband, as you know, was killed by a Mriswith, Richard said. She is staying here for protection. You mean there is danger for us? 
Very possibly, Richard said. Her husband was an expert swordsman. Yet he... Well, I hope you will be careful. If you join with us, then you are entitled to be guests of the palace and the protection of my magic. There are plenty of empty guest rooms, but they will remain empty until you surrender. Accompanied by worried chatter, they headed for the doors. Shall we go? Catherine asked in a breathy voice. His task done, Richard felt the sudden emptiness being filled with her presence. As she took his arm and they started away, he summoned the last shred of his will to stop at the end of the dais, where Ulick and Kara were standing. Keep us in sight at all times, understand? Yes, Lord Rall, Ulick and Kara said as one. Catherine tugged on his arm, urging his ear close. Richard, her warm breath carrying his name, sent a shudder of longing through him. You said we would be alone. I want to be alone with you. Very alone, please. It was from this moment that Richard had borrowed strength. He could no longer hold the image of the sword in his mind. In desperation, he put Kaelin's face there in its stead. There is danger about Catherine. I can sense it. I won't risk your life carelessly. When I don't feel the danger, then we can be alone. Please try to understand for now. She looked distraught, but nodded. For now. As they stepped off the platform, Richard's gaze snagged on Kara's. Don't let us out of your sight for anything. Chapter 24 Phoebe plopped down the reports in a narrow, vacant spot on the polished walnut table. Verna, may I ask you a personal question? Verna scrawled her initials across the bottom of a report from the kitchens requesting replacements for the large cauldrons that had burned through. We've been friends for a good long time, Phoebe. You may ask me anything you wish. She again scrutinized the request, and then above her initials, she wrote a note denying permission and telling them to instead have the cauldrons repaired. Verna reminded herself to show a smile. Ask. Phoebe's round cheeks flushed as she twisted her fingers together. Well, I mean no offense, but you're in a unique position, and I could never ask anyone else but a friend like you. She cleared her throat. What's it like to get old? Verna snorted a laugh. We're the same age, Phoebe. She wiped her palms at the hips of her green dress as Verna watched. Yes, but you've been away for more than 20 years. You've aged that much, just like those outside the palace. It will take me near to 300 years to age to where you are right now. Why, you look like a woman of almost 40. Verna sighed. Yes, well, a journey will do that to you. At least mine did. I don't want to ever go on a journey and get old. Does it hurt or something to so suddenly be old? Do you feel, I don't know, like you're not attractive and life is no longer sweet? I like it when men view me as desirable. I don't want to get old like... It worries me. Verna pushed away from the table and leaned back in her chair. Her strongest urge was to strangle the woman. But she took a breath and reminded herself that it was a friend's sincere question asked out of ignorance. I would guess that everyone views it in their own unique way, but I can tell you what it means for me. Yes, it hurts a bit, Phoebe, to know that something is gone and can never be recovered. As if I was somehow not paying attention and my youth was stolen from me while I was waiting for my life to start. But the Creator balances it with good, too. Good? What good could come of it? Well, inside, I'm still myself, but wiser. I find that I have a clearer understanding of myself and what I want. I appreciate things I never did before. I see better what's really important in doing the Creator's work. I suppose you could say I feel more content and worry less about what others think of me. Even though I've aged, that doesn't diminish my longing for others. I find comfort in friends, and yes, to answer what you're thinking, I still long for men much the same as I always did, but now I have a wider appreciation for them. I find callow youth less interesting. Men need not simply be young to stir my feelings, and the simple hold less appeal. Phoebe's eyes were wide as she leaned forward attentively. Really? Older men stir longings in you? Verna checked her tongue. What I meant by older, Phoebe, was men older like me. The men that catch your interest now? Fifty years ago, you wouldn't have considered walking with a man the age you are now. But now it seems natural to you because you're that age. And men now the age you were back then seem immature to you. See what I mean? Well, I guess. Verna could read it in her eyes that she didn't. 
When we first came here as young girls, like the two down in the vaults last night, novices Helen and Valerie, what did you think of women who were the age you are now? Phoebe covered a giggle with her hand. I thought them impossibly old. I never thought I'd be this age. And now, how do you feel about your age? Oh, it isn't old at all. I guess I was just foolish at that young age. I like being this age. I'm still young, Verna shrugged. It's much the same for me. I view myself in much the way you view yourself. I no longer see older people as simply old, because I now know that they're the same as you or I. They view themselves the same as you or I view ourselves. The young woman wrinkled her nose. I guess I see what you mean, but I still don't want to get old. Phoebe, in the outside world, you would have lived nearly three lives by now. You, we, have been given a great gift by the Creator to be able to have as many years as we do living here at the palace in order to have the time necessary to train young wizards in their gift. Appreciate what you were given. It's a rare benevolence that touches only a handful. Phoebe nodded slowly, and behind the slight squint, Verna could almost see the labor of contemplative reasoning. That's very wise, Verna. I never knew you were so wise. I always knew you were smart, but you never seemed wise to me before. Verna smiled. That's one of the other advantages, those younger than you think you wise. In a land of the blind, a one-eyed woman could be queen. But it seems so frightening to have your flesh go limp and wrinkly. It happens gradually. You become somewhat accustomed to yourself growing older. To me, the thought of being your age again seems frightening. Why is that? Verna wanted to say that it was because she feared walking around with such an underdeveloped intellect, but she reminded herself once again that she and Phoebe had shared a good part of their lives as friends. Oh, I guess because I've been through some of the thorn hedges you have yet to face, and I know their sting. What sort of thorns? I think they're different for each person. Everyone has to walk her own path. Phoebe wrung her hands as she leaned over even more. What were the thorns on your path, Verna? Verna stood and pushed the stopper back into the ink bottle. She stared down at her desk, not seeing it. I guess, she said in a distant tone, the worst was returning to have Jedediah look at me with eyes like yours. Eyes that saw a wrinkled, dried-up, old, unattractive hag. Oh, please, Verna, I never meant to suggest that. Do you even consider the thorn in that, Phoebe? Why, to be thought old and ugly? Of course, even though you are not that. Verna shook her head. No. She looked up into the other's eyes. No, the thorn was to discover that appearance was all that ever mattered, and that what was inside, she tapped the side of her head, didn't hold any meaning for him, only its wrapping. Even worse than returning to see that look in Jedediah's eyes, though, was to discover that he had given himself over to the keeper, in order to save Richard's life, as Jedediah was about to kill him, Verna had buried her Dakra in his back. Jedediah had betrayed not only her, but the Creator, too. A part of her had died with him. Phoebe straightened, looking a bit puzzled. Yes, I guess I know what you mean. When men... Verna waved her hand in a dismissive gesture. I hope I've been of help, Phoebe. It's always good to talk to a friend. Her voice took on the clear ring of authority. Are there any petitioners to see me? Phoebe blinked. Petitioners? No, not today. Good. I wish to go pray and seek the Creator's guidance. Would you and Dulcinea please shield the door? I wish not to be disturbed. Phoebe curtsied. Of course, Prelate. She smiled warmly. Thank you for the talk, Verna. It was like old times in our room after we were ordered to be sleeping. Her gaze darted to the stacks of papers. But what about the reports? They're falling further behind. As prelate, I cannot ignore the light that directs the palace and the sisters. I must also pray for us and ask for his guidance. We are, after all, the sisters of the light. The look of awe returned to Phoebe's eyes. Phoebe seemed to believe that in assuming the post, Verna had somehow become more than human and could somehow touch the hand of the Creator in a miraculous way. Of course, prelate. I will see to the placement of the shield. No one will disturb the prelate's meditation. Before Phoebe went through the door, Verna called her name in a quiet tone. Have you learned anything yet about Christabel? Phoebe's eyes turned away in sudden disquiet. No, no one knows where she went. We've had no word on where Amelia or Janet have disappeared to either. The five of them, 
Christabel, Amelia, Janet, Phoebe, and Verna had been friends, had grown up together at the palace, but Verna had been closest to Christabel, though they were all a bit jealous of her. The creator had blessed her with gorgeous blonde hair and comely features, but also with a kind and warm nature. Age 208. It was disturbing that her three friends seemed to have vanished. Sisters sometimes left the palace for visits home, while their families were still living, but they requested permission first. And besides, the families of those three would all have passed away of old age long ago. Sisters, too, sometimes went away for a time, not only to refresh their minds in the outside world, but also to simply have a break from decade upon decade at the palace. Even then, they almost always would tell the others that they had to leave for a time and where they were going. None of her three friends had done that. They had simply shown up missing after the prelate died. Verna's heart ached with the worry that they simply couldn't accept her as prelate and had chosen instead to leave the palace. But as much as it hurt, she prayed it was that and not something darker that had taken them. If you hear anything, Phoebe, Verna said, trying to hide her concern, please come tell me. After the woman had gone, Verna placed her own shield inside the doors, a telltale shield she had devised herself. The delicate filaments spun from the center of her own unique Han, magic she would recognize as her own. Should anyone try to enter, they probably wouldn't detect the diaphanous shield and would tear the fragile threads. Even if they did manage to detect it, their mere presence and the act of probing for a shield would still unavoidably tear it. And if they then repaired the weave with Han of their own, Verna would know that too. Hazy sunlight filtered through the trees near the garden wall, infusing the quiet wooded area of the retreat with a muted, dreamy light. The small wood lot ended as a clump of sweet bay, their branches heavy with hairy white buds. The trail beyond meandered into a well-tended patch of blue and yellow flowering ground cover surrounding islands of taller lace lady ferns and monarch roses. Verna broke a twig off one of the sweet bays and idly savored its spicy aroma as she surveyed the wall while striding along the path. At the rear of the planting stood a thicket of shining sumac, the ribbon of small trees placed deliberately to screen the high wall protecting the prelate's garden and give the illusion of more expansive grounds. She eyed the squat trunks and spreading branches critically. They might do if nothing better could be found. She moved on. She was already late. On a small side trail around the back side of the wide place where the prelate's sanctuary stood hidden, she found a promising spot. Once she had lifted her dress and stepped through the shrubs to reach the wall, she could see that it was perfect. Sheltered all around by pine was a sunlit area where pear trees had been espaliered against the wall. While they were all trained and pruned, one seemed to be particularly suitable. Its limbs to each side alternated like the steps of a single pole ladder. Just before Verna hiked her skirts up and started to climb, the texture of the bark caught her eye. She rubbed a finger along the top edge of stout limbs, seeing that they were calloused and rough. It would appear she was not the first prelate to want to surreptitiously depart the prelate's compound. Once she had climbed atop the wall and had checked that no guards were in sight, she found there was a convenient abutment to a reinforcing pilaster to step down on. And then a drain tile, and then a decorative stone sticking out, and then a low spreading limb of a smoky oak, and then a round rock not two feet from the wall and an easy hop to the ground. She brushed off the bark and leaves, and then straightened her gray dress at the hips and ordered the simple collar. She slipped the prelate's ring into a pocket. As she draped her heavy black shawl over her head and tied it under her chin, Verna grinned with the thrill of having found a secret way to escape her prison of paper. She was surprised to find the palace grounds uncommonly deserted. Guards patrolled their posts, and sisters, novices, and young men in collars dotted the paths and stoned walkways as they went about their business, but there were few city people to be seen, most of them old women. Every day during the daylight hours, people from the city of Tanimura poured across the bridges to Hall's Band Island to seek advice from the sisters, to petition for intervention in disputes, to request charity, to seek guidance in the Creator's wisdom, and to worship in the courtyards all over the island. Why they would think they needed to come here to worship had always seemed odd to Verna, 
but she knew these people viewed the home of the Sisters of the Light as hallowed ground. Perhaps they simply enjoyed the beauty of the palace grounds. They weren't enjoying it now. There were virtually no city people to be seen. Novices assigned to guide visitors paced in boredom. Guards at the gates to restricted areas chatted among themselves, and those who glanced her way saw only another sister going about her business. The lawns were empty of reposing guests. The formal gardens displayed their beauty to no one, and the fountains sprayed and splashed without the accompaniment of astonished gasps from adults or delighted squeals from children. Even the gossip benches sat vacant. In the distance, the drums beat on. Verna found Warren sitting on the dark, flat rock at their meeting place in the rushes on the city side of the river. He was skipping stones out onto the swirling waters, prowled by one lone fishing boat. Warren jumped up when he heard her approach. Verna, I didn't know if you were ever going to come. Verna watched the old man bait his hooks as his skiff rolled gently beneath his steady legs. Phoebe wanted to know what it was like to get old and wrinkled. Warren brushed dirt from the seat of his violet robes. Why would she ask you? Verna only sighed at his blank expression. Let's get going. The journey through the city toward the outskirts proved as strange as the palace grounds. While some of the shops in the wealthy sections were open and doing a bit of trade with a scattering of people, the market in the indigent section was vacant, its tables empty, cook fires cold, and shop windows shuttered. The lean-to shelters were deserted, the looms in the workshops abandoned, and the streets silent but for the constant grating presence of the drums. Warren acted as if there were nothing unusual about the ghostly streets. As the two of them turned down a narrow, deeply shadowed, dusty street lined with dilapidated buildings, Verna had had enough and finally erupted in fury. Where is everyone? What's going on? Warren stopped and turned to give her a puzzled look as she stood, fists on hips, in the center of the empty street. It's Jala Day. She fixed him with a scowl. Jala Day, he nodded, the puzzled frown deepening. Yes, Jala Day. What did you think happened to all the... Warren slapped his forehead. I'm sorry, Verna, I thought you knew. We've become so accustomed to it, I just forgot you wouldn't know. Verna folded her arms. Know what? Warren returned to take her arm and started her walking again. Ja La is a game, a contest. He pointed over his shoulder. They built a big playing field in the bowl between two hills on the outskirts of the city, over that way, about, oh, I guess it must have been 15 or 20 years ago when the emperor came to rule. Everyone loves it. A game? The entire city empties out to go watch a game? Warren nodded. I'm afraid so. Except a few, mostly older people. They don't understand it and aren't too interested. But most everyone else is. It's become the people's passion. Children start playing it in the streets almost as soon as they can walk. Verna eyed a side street and checked behind the way they had come. What kind of game is this? Warren shrugged. I've never been to an official game yet. I spend most of my time down in the vaults, but I've delved into the subject a bit. I've always been interested in games and how they fit into the structure of different cultures. I've studied ancient peoples and their games, but this gives me the chance to observe a living game for myself. So I read up on it and made inquiries. Ja La is played by two teams on a square Ja La field, marked out with grids. In each corner is a goal, two for each team. The teams try to put the brock, a heavy leather-covered ball, a little smaller than a man's head, in one of their opponent's goals. If they do, then they get a point, and the other team gets to pick a grid square from which they begin their turn at attack. I don't understand the strategy. It gets complex, but five-year-olds seem to be able to grasp it in no time. Probably because they want to play and you don't. Verna untied her shawl and flapped the ends, trying to cool her neck. What's so interesting about it that everyone would want to go to crowd together in the sun to see it? I guess it takes them away from their toil for a day of festivity. It gives them an excuse to cheer and scream and to drink and celebrate if their team wins, or to drink and console one another if their team loses. Everyone gets quite worked up over it, more worked up than they should. Verna thought it over a moment as she felt a refreshing breeze cool her neck. Well, I guess that sounds harmless. Warren glanced over out of the corner of his eye. It's a bloody game. Bloody? Warren sidestepped a pile of dung. 
The ball is heavy and the rules loose. The men who play Ja La are savage. While they must, of course, be adept at handling the brock, they're selected mostly because of their brawn and their brutal aggressiveness. Not many a game goes by without at least some teeth getting knocked out or a bone broken. It isn't rare for a neck to get broken either. Verna stared incredulously. And people like to watch that? Warren grunted a humorless confirmation. From what the guards tell me, the crowd gets ugly if there isn't blood, because they think it means their team isn't trying hard enough. Verna shook her head. Well, it doesn't sound like anything I would enjoy watching. That isn't the worst of it. Warren kept his eyes ahead as he strode along the shadowed street. To the sides, shutters so faded it was hard to tell they had ever been painted stood closed over narrow windows. The losing team is brought out onto the field when the game is over and each is flogged. One lash with a big leather whip for each point scored against them, administered by the winning team. And the rivalry between teams is bitter. It isn't unheard of for men to die from the flogging. Verna walked in stunned silence as they turned a corner. The people stay for this flogging? I think that's what they go for. The entire crowd supporting the winning team counts out the number of lashes as they're laid on. Emotions run pretty high. People get really worked up over Jala. Sometimes there are riots. Even with 10,000 troops trying to keep order, things can get out of hand. The players sometimes start the brawl. The men who play Jala are brutes. People really like rooting for a team of brutes? The players are heroes. Jala players virtually have the run of the city and can do no wrong. Rules and laws rarely apply to Ja La players. Crowds of women follow the players around, and after a game there's usually a team orgy. Women fight over who will be with a Ja La player. The spree goes on for days. To have been with a player is an honor of the highest order, and is so highly contested that bragging rights require witnesses. Why? was all she could think to say. Warren threw up his hands. You're a woman, you tell me. When I've been the first in 3,000 years to solve a prophecy, I've never had a woman throw her arms around my neck or want to lick the blood off my back. They do that? Fight over it. If he's pleased with her tongue, he might pick her. I hear the players are pretty arrogant and like to make the eager women earn the honor of being under him. Verna looked over and saw that Warren's face was glowing red. They even want to be with the losing players? It's irrelevant. He's a Jala player, a hero. The more brutal, the better. The ones who have killed an opponent with a Jala ball are renowned and are most sought after by the women. People name babies after them. I just don't understand it. You're just seeing a small sampling of people, Warren. If you were to go into the city instead of spending all your time down in the vaults, women would want to be with you, too. He tapped his bare neck. They would if I still had a collar, because they would see the palace's gold around my neck, that's all. They wouldn't want to be with me because of who I am. Verna pursed her lips. Some people are attracted by power. When you have no power yourself, it can be very seductive. That's just the way life is. Life, he repeated with a sour grunt. Ja La is what everyone calls it, but its full name is Ja La de Hijin, the game of life in the old tongue of the emperor's homeland of Alterang. But everyone simply calls it Jala, the game. What does Alterang mean? Alterang is from their old tongue, too. It doesn't translate well, but it means, approximately, the creator's chosen, or destiny's people. Something like that. Why? The new world is split by a mountain range called the Rang Shada. It sounds like the same language. Warren nodded. Uh, Shada is an armored war gauntlet with spikes. Rang Shada would roughly mean War Fist of the Chosen. A name from the old war, I guess. Spikes would certainly apply to those mountains. Verna's head was still spinning with Warren's story. I can't believe this game is allowed. Allowed? It's encouraged. The Emperor has his own personal Ja La team. It was announced this morning that when he comes for his visit, he's going to bring his team to play Tanamura's top team. Quite an honor, from what I gather, as everyone is beside themselves with excitement at the prospect. Warren glanced around and then turned back to her again. The Emperor's team doesn't get flogged if they lose. She lifted an eyebrow. The privilege of the mighty? Not exactly, Warren said. If they lose, they get beheaded. 
Verna's hands dropped away from the points of her shawl. Why would such a game be encouraged by the Emperor? Warren smiled a private smile. I don't know, Verna, but I have my theories. Such as? Well, if you have conquered a land, what problems do you suppose might present themselves? You mean insurrection? Warren brushed back a lock of his curly blonde hair. Turmoil, protests, civil unrest, riots, and yes, insurrection. Do you remember when King Gregory ruled? Verna nodded as she watched an old woman far up a side street draping wet clothes over a balcony railing. It was the only person she had seen in the last hour. What happened to him? Not long after you left, the Imperial Order took over, and that was the last we heard of him. The king was well thought of, and Tanamura prospered, along with the other cities under his rule in the north. Since then, times have become hard for the people. The emperor allowed corruption to flourish, and at the same time ignored important matters of commerce and justice. All those people you've seen living in squalor are refugees come to Tanamura from smaller towns, villages, and cities that were sacked. They seem a quiet and content lot for refugees. An eyebrow lifted over a blue eye. Jala. What do you mean? They have little hope of a better life under the imperial order. The one thing they can hope for, dream about, is to become a Jala player. The players are selected because of their talent at the game, not because they have rank or power. The family of a player need never want for anything again. He can provide for them in abundance. Parents encourage their children to play Ja La, hoping they will become paid players. Amateur teams, classed by age group, start with five-year-olds. Anyone, no matter their background, can become a paid Ja La player. Players have even come from the ranks of the Emperor's slaves. But that still doesn't explain the passion for it. Everyone is part of the Imperial Order now. No devotion to one's former land is allowed. Ja La lets people be devoted to something, to their neighbors, to their city, through their team. The Emperor paid to have the Ja La field built, a gift to the people. The people are distracted from the conditions of their lives, over which they have no control, and into an outlet that doesn't threaten the Emperor. Verna flapped the ends of her shawl again. I don't think your theory casts a shadow, Warren. From a young age, children like to play games. They do it all day. People have always played games. When they get older, they have contests with the bow, with horses, with dice. It's part of human nature to play at games. This way, Warren caught her sleeve and pointed with a thumb, turning her down a narrow alley. And the Emperor is channeling that tendency into something more than natural. He need not worry about their minds wandering to thoughts of their freedom, or even simple matters of justice. Their passion now is Ja La. Their minds are dulled to everything else. Instead of wondering why the Emperor is coming, and what it will mean for their lives, Everyone is a flutter because of Jala. Verna felt her stomach lurch. She had been wondering just why the Emperor was coming. There had to be a reason for him to come all this way, and she didn't think it was just to watch his team play Jala. He wanted something. Aren't the people worried about defeating such a powerful man or his team anyway? The Emperor's team is very good, I'm told. But they don't have any special privilege or advantage. The Emperor takes no affront at his team losing. Except, of course, with his players. If an opponent bests them, the Emperor will acknowledge their skill and heartily congratulate them and their city. People long for that honor, to best the Emperor's renowned team. I've been back for a couple months, and I've never seen the city empty out for this game before. The season just started. Official games are only allowed to be played in the Jala season. That doesn't fit with your theory, then. If the game is a distraction from more important matters of life, why not let them play it all the time? Warren gave her a smug smile. Anticipation makes the fervor stronger. The prospects for the upcoming season are talked about endlessly. By the time the season finally arrives, the people are worked up into a fever pitch. Like young lovers return to the embrace after an absence, their minds are dull to anything else. If the game went on all the time, the ardor might cool. Warren had obviously thought long and hard on his theory. She didn't think she believed in it, but he seemed to have an answer for everything, so she changed the subject. Where did you hear this, about him bringing his team? Master Finch. Warren, I sent you to the stables to find out about those horses, not to gab about Ja La. Master Finch is a big Ja La enthusiast and was all excited about today's opening game, so I let him ramble on about it so I could find out what you wanted to know. And did you? They came to an abrupt halt, looking up at a carved sign displaying a headstone, shovel, and the names Benstant and Sproul. Yes, 
Between telling me how many lashes the other team was going to get and telling me how to make money betting on the outcome, he told me that the missing horses have been gone for quite a time. Since right after winter solstice, I'd bet. Warren shielded his eyes with a hand as he peered into the window. You'd win the bet. Four of his strongest horses, but full tack for only two, are gone. He's still searching for the horses and swears he'll find them, but he thinks the tack was stolen. From behind the door in the back of the dark room, she could hear the sound of a file on steel. Warren took his hand from his face and checked the street. Sounds like there's someone here who isn't a Jala enthusiast. Good. Verna tied the shawl under her chin and then pulled open the door. Let's go hear what this grave digger has to say. Chapter 25 Only the small street-side window, coated with ancient layers of dirt, and an open door in the back lit the dim, dusty room. But it was enough to see a path through the cluttered mounds of sloppy rolls of winding sheets, rickety workbenches, and simple coffins. A few rusty saws and planes hung on one wall, and a disorderly stack of pine planks leaned against another. While people of means frequented undertakers who provided guidance in the selection of ornate, expensive coffins for their loved ones, people with precious little money could afford no more than the services of simple grave diggers who supplied a plain box and a hole to put it in. While the departed loved ones of those who came to grave diggers were no less precious to them, they had to worry about feeding the living. Their memories of the deceased, however, were no less gilded. Verna and Warren paused at the doorway out into a tiny pit of a workyard, its borders steep and high with lumber stacked upright against a fence to the back and stuccoed buildings at each side. In the center, with his back to them, a gangly, barefoot man in tattered clothes stood facing away from them as he filed the blades of his shovels. My condolences on the loss of your loved one, he said in a gravely but surprisingly sincere voice. He resumed drawing the file against the steel. Child or adult? Neither, Verna said. The hollow-cheeked man glanced back over his shoulder. He wore no beard, but looked as if his efforts at shaving were rare enough that he was close to crossing the line. In between, then. If you'll tell me the size of the departed, I can work a box to fit. Verna clasped her hands. We've no one to bury. We're here to ask you some questions. He quieted his hands and turned around fully to look them up and down. Well, I can see that you can afford more than me. You aren't interested in Jala? Warren asked. The man's droopy eyes came a little more alert as he took another look at Warren's violet robes. Folks don't fancy the likes of me around at festive occasions. Spoils their good time to look on my face like it were the face of death itself walking among them. Aren't shy about telling them I'm not welcome either. But they come by when they've need of me. They come then and act like they never turned their eyes away before. I could let them go pay for a fancy box what the dead won't see, but they can't afford it. And their coin don't do me no good if I grudge them their fears. Which are you, Verna asked, Master Benstant or Sproul? His flaccid eyelids bunched into creases as his eyes turned up to her. I'm Milton Sproul. And Master Benstant? Is he about to? Ham's not here. What's this about? Verna bowed her mouth in a nonchalant expression. We're from the palace and wanted to ask about a tally we were sent. We just need to be sure it's correct and everything is in order. The bony man turned back to his shovel and stroked the file across the edge. Tally's correct. We'd not cheat the sisters. Of course we aren't suggesting any such thing. It's just that we can't find any record of who it was you buried. We just need to verify the deceased, and then we can authorize payment. Don't know. Ham done the work and made out the tally. He's an honest man. He wouldn't cheat a thief to get back what was stole from him. He made out the tally and told me to send it over. That's all I know. I see, Verna shrugged. Then I guess we'll need to see Master Benstant in order to clear this up. Where can we find him? Sproul took another stroke with his file. Don't know. Ham was getting on in years, said he wanted to spend what little time was left to him, being with his daughter and grandchildren. He left to be with them. They lived down country somewheres. He circled his file in the air. Left his half of the place, such as it is to me. Left me his half of the work, too. Guess I'll have to take on a younger man to do the digging. I'm getting old myself. 
But you must know where he went and about this tally. Said I don't. He packed up all his things, not that that was much, and bought himself a donkey for the journey, so I reckon it must be a goodly distance. He pointed his file over his shoulder toward the south. Like I said, down country. The last thing he told me was to be sure I sent the tally to the palace because he'd done the work and it was only fair that they pay for what was done. I asked him where to send the payment as he'd done the work, but he said to use it to hire a new man. Said it was only fair, what with him leaving me on such short notice. Verna considered her options. I see. She watched him take a dozen strokes on his shovel and then turned to Warren. Go outside and wait for me. What? He whispered heatedly. Why do you... Verna held up a finger to silence him. Do as I say. Take a little walk around the area to be sure our friends aren't looking for us. She leaned a little closer with a meaningful look. They might be wondering if we need any assistance. Warren straightened and glanced at the man filing his shovel. Oh. Yes, all right. I'll go look and see where our friends have gotten to. He fumbled with the silver brocade on his sleeve. You won't be long, will you? No, I'll be out shortly. Go on now. And see if you see them anywhere. After Verna heard the front door shut, Sproul glanced over his shoulder. Answer still the same. I told you what. Verna produced a gold coin in her fingers. Now, Master Sproul, you and I are going to have a candid conversation. What's more, you are going to answer my questions truthfully. He frowned suspiciously. Why'd you send him out? She no longer made an effort to show him a pleasant smile. The boy has a weak stomach. He took an unconcerned stroke with his file. I told you the truth. If you want to lie, then just tell me and I'll build you one to fit. Verna shot him a menacing scowl. Don't you even think of lying to me. You may have told the truth, but not all the truth there is to tell. Now you are going to tell me the rest of it, either in exchange for this token of my appreciation. Verna used her hand to snatch the file from his hand and sent it sailing up into the air until it vanished from sight or an appreciation for my sparing you any unpleasantness. Whistling with speed, the file streaked out of the sky to slam into the ground, burying itself a scant inch from the gravedigger's toes. Only the tang stuck above the dirt, and that glowed red. With angry mental effort, she drew the hot steel up in a long, thin line of molten metal. Its white-hot glow illuminated his shocked expression, and she, too, could feel the sizzling heat on her face. His eyes had gone wide. She waggled a finger, and the ductile line of glowing steel wavered before his eyes, dancing in time with her finger's movement. She swirled her finger, and the hot steel coiled around the man, holding mere inches from his flesh. One twitch of my finger, Master Sproul, and I bind you up in your file. She opened her hand, holding her palm up, a howl of flame ignited, hovering obediently in the air. After I have you bound up, then I will start at your feet, and I'll cook you an inch at a time until you give me the whole truth. His crooked teeth chattered. Please. She brought the coin up in her other hand and showed him a humorless smile. Or, as I say, you can choose to tell me the truth in exchange for this token of my appreciation. He swallowed, eyeing the hot metal around him and the hissing flame in her hand. It seems I do recall some more of it. I'd be most pleased if you'd let me set the story straight with the rest I'm now remembering. Verna extinguished the flame above her hand, and with an abrupt effort, flipped the Han's heat to its opposite, to bitter cold. The glow left the metal like a candle's flame being snuffed. The steel went from red hot to icy black and shattered, the fragments dropping around the stiff grave digger like hail. Verna lifted his hand and pressed the gold into it, closing his fingers around the coin. I'm so sorry, I seem to have broken your file. This will more than cover it, I'm sure. He nodded. It was likely more gold than the man could earn in a year. I've got more files. It's nothing. She laid a hand on his shoulder. All right, Master Sproul, why don't you tell me what else you remember about that tally? She tightened her grip. Every last bit of it no matter how unimportant you consider it. Understand? He licked his lips. Yes, I'll tell you every bit, just like I said. Ham did the work. I didn't know nothing about it. Said he had some digging to do for the palace, but nothing more. Ham's the close-mouthed sort, and I never paid it no mind. Right after, he broke it on me real sudden-like that he was quitting and going off to live with his daughter, just like I told you. 
He was always talking about going to live with his daughter before he had to dig his own hole. But he didn't have no money, and she's no better off, so I never paid him no mind. Then he bought that donkey, a good one too, so I knew he weren't mooning this time. He said he didn't want the money from the work for the palace, said to hire a new man to help me. Well, the next night before he left, he brought over a bottle of liquor. Good stuff, what cost more than the bottles we always bought. Ham never could keep a secret from me when he gets to drinking. Everyone knows the truth of that. He don't tell what he shouldn't to others, understand. He's a man to be trusted, but he'll tell me everything if he's been drinking. Verna took her hand back. I understand. Ham is a good man and your friend. I don't want you to worry about betraying a confidence, Milton. I'm a sister. You aren't doing wrong to confide in me, and you need not fear I will bring trouble to you for it. He nodded, clearly relieved, and managed a weak smile. Well, like I said, we had that bottle and we was talking old times. He was leaving, and I knew I'd be missing him, you know. We was together for a long time, not that we didn't. You were friends, I understand. What did he say? He loosened his collar. Well, we was drinking and feeling all misty-eyed about breaking up. That bottle was stronger than what we was used to. I asked him where his daughter lived so I could send him the pay from the tally to help out with things. I got this place, after all, and I can get by. I got work. But Ham says, no, he don't need it. Don't need it? Well, I was powerful curious after he said that. I asked him where he got money, and he said he saved it. Ham never saved nothing. If he had it, it was because he just got it, that's all, and hadn't spent it yet. Well, that's when he told me to be sure to send the tally to the palace. He was real insistent. I guess because he felt bad about leaving me with no help. So I asks him, Hey, who'd you put in the ground for the palace? Milton leaned toward her, lowering his voice to a gravelly whisper. Didn't put no one in the ground, Ham says. I took him out. Verna snatched the man's dirty collar. What? He dug someone up? Is that what he meant? He dug someone up? Milton nodded. That's it. Have you ever heard of such a thing? Digging up the dead. Putting them in the ground don't bother me. It's what I do, but the idea of digging them up gives me the shivers. Seems a desecration. Of course, at the time, we was drinking to old times and all, and we was in stitches over it. Verna's mind was racing in every direction at once. Who did he exhume? And on whose orders? All he said was for the palace. How long ago? A good long time. I don't remember. Wait. It was after the winter solstice, not long after. Maybe just a couple of days. She shook him by the collar. Who was it? Who did he dig up? I asked him. I asked him who it were they wanted back. He told me. He says they didn't care who, I'm just to bring him. Wrapped up all pretty in clean winding sheets. Verna worked her fingers on his collar. Are you sure? You were drinking. He might have just been making up drunken stories. He shook his head as if he feared she were going to bite it off. No, I swear, Ham don't make up stories or lie when he drinks. When he drinks, he would tell me anything true. No matter what sin he done, when he drinks, he confesses it to me true. And I remember what he told me. It was the last night I saw my friend. I remember what he said. He said to be sure to get the tally to the palace, but to wait a few weeks, as they was busy, they'd told him. What did he do with the body? Where did he take it? Who did he give it to? Milton tried to back away a bit, but her grip on his collar didn't allow it. I don't know. He said he took him to the palace in a cart covered over real good, and he said they give him a special pass so as the guards wouldn't check his load. He had to dress in his best clothes so people wouldn't recognize him for what he was, so as not to frighten the fine people at the palace, and especially so as not to upset the delicate sensibilities of the sisters, who were communing with the Creator. He said he'd done as he was told, and he was proud that he'd done it right, because no one got disturbed by his going there with the bodies. That's all he said about it. I don't know no more. I swear it on my hope to go to the Creator's light after this life be done. Bodies. You said bodies. More than one? She fixed him with a dangerous glare as she tightened her grip. How many? How many bodies did he dig up and deliver to the palace? Two. Two, she repeated in a whisper, wide-eyed. He nodded. Verna's hand fell away from his collar. Two. Two bodies wrapped in clean winding sheets. Her fists tightened as she growled in a rage. Milton swallowed, holding up a hand. 
One other thing. I don't know if it matters. What? She asked through gritted teeth. He said that they wanted them fresh, and one was small and weren't too bad, but the other gave him a time because he were a big one. I didn't think to ask him more about it. I'm sorry. With great effort, she managed to smile. Thank you, Milton. You've been a great help to the creator. He scrunched his shirt closed at the neck. Thank you, sister. Sister, I've never had the nerve to go to the palace being what I am and all. I know folks don't like to see me around. Well, I've never gone. Sister, could you give me the creator's blessing? Of course, Milton. You have done his work. He closed his eyes with a murmured prayer. Verna gently touched his forehead. The creator's blessing on his child, she whispered, as she let the warmth of her Han flow into his mind. He gasped in rapture. Verna let her Han seep through his mind. You will remember nothing of what Ham told you about the tally while you were drinking. You will recall only that he said he did the work, but you know nothing of its nature. After I've left, you will not recall my visit. His eyes rolled beneath his eyelids for a time before coming open at last. Thank you, sister. Warren was pacing on the street outside. She stormed past him without stopping to say anything. He ran to catch up. Verna was a thunderhead. I'll strangle her, she growled under her breath. I'll strangle her with my bare hands. I don't care if the keeper takes me. I'll have her throat in my hands. What are you talking about? What did you find out? Verna, slow down. Don't talk to me right now, Warren. Don't say a word. She swept through the streets, her fists whipping in time to her furious strides, a storm rampaging across the land. The churning knot of fury in her stomach threatened to ignite in lightning. She didn't see the streets or buildings or hear the drums thundering in the background. She forgot Warren trotting behind her. She could see nothing but a vision of vengeance. She was blind to where she was, lost in a world of rage. Without knowing how she had gotten there, she found herself crossing one of the back bridges onto Hall's Band Island. In the center crest above the river, she stamped to a halt so abruptly that Warren almost collided with her. She snatched the silver braiding at his collar. You get yourself down into the vaults and link up that prophecy. What are you talking about? She shook him by his robes. The one that says that when the prelate and the prophet are given to the light in the sacred rite, the flames will bring to boil a cauldron of guile and give ascension to a false prelate who will reign over the death of the palace of the prophets. Find the branches, link it up. Find out everything you can, do you understand? Warren snatched his robes free and tugged them straight. What's this about? What did the gravedigger tell you? She held up a cautionary finger. Not now, Warren. We're supposed to be friends, Verna. We're in this together, remember? I want to know. Her voice was thunder on the horizon. Do as I tell you. If you press me right now, Warren, you are going to go for a swim. Now go link up that prophecy. And as soon as you find anything, you come tell me. Verna knew about the prophecies in the vaults. She knew that it could easily take years to link branches. It could take centuries. What choice was there? He brushed dust from his robes giving his eyes an excuse to look elsewhere. As you wish, prelate. As he turned to go, she could see that his eyes were red and puffy. She wanted to catch his arm and stop him, but he was already too far away. She wanted to call out to him and tell him that she wasn't angry at him, that it wasn't his fault that she was the false prelate, but her voice failed her. She found the round rock beneath the limb and sprang up the wall. Bothering with only two branches on the pear tree, she dropped to the ground inside the prelate's compound and when she regained her feet, started running. Panting in hurt, she slapped her hand repeatedly against the door to the prelate's sanctuary, but it wouldn't open. Remembering why, she dug in her pocket and found the ring. Inside, she pressed it against the sunburst on the door to close it, and then with all her anger and anguish, heaved the ring across the room, hearing it clatter against the walls and skitter across the floor. Verna pried the journey book from the secret pouch sewn on the back of her belt and plopped down on the three-legged stool. Gasping for her breath, she fumbled the stylus from the spine of the little black book. She opened it, spreading it flat on the small table, and stared at the blank page. She tried to think through the rage and resentment. She had to consider the possibility that she could be wrong. No, she wasn't wrong. Still, she was a sister of the light, for what that was worth, and knew better than to risk everything on presumption. She had to think of a way to verify who had the other book. And she also had to do it in a way that wouldn't betray her identity if she was wrong. But she wasn't wrong. She knew who had it. 
Verna kissed her ring finger as she whispered a prayer beseeching the Creator's guidance and asking, too, for strength. She wanted to vent her wrath, but before all else, she had to make sure. With trembling fingers, she picked up the stylus and began to write. You must first tell me the reason you chose me the last time. I remember every word. One mistake, and this journey book feeds the fire. Verna closed the book and tucked it back into its secret pouch in her belt. Shaking, she pulled the comforter from its resting place atop the box bench and dragged it to the overstuffed chair. Feeling more lonely than she had ever felt in her entire life, she curled up in the chair. Verna remembered her last meeting with Prelate Annalena when Verna had returned with Richard after all those years. Annalena hadn't wanted to see her, and it had taken weeks to finally be granted an audience. As long as she lived, no matter how many hundreds of years that might be, she would never forget that meeting or the things the prelate had told her. Verna had been furious to discover the prelate had withheld valuable information. The prelate had used her and never told her the reasons. The prelate had asked if Verna knew why she had been selected to go after Richard. Verna said she had thought it was a vote of confidence. The prelate said it was because she suspected that sisters Grace and Elizabeth, who had been on the journey with her and had been the first two to be selected, were sisters of the dark, and she had privileged information from prophecy that said the first two sisters would die. The prelate said she had used her prerogative to pick Verna as the third sister to go. Verna asked, You chose me because you had faith that I was not one of them? I chose you, Verna, the prelate said, because you were far down on the list, and because, all in all, you are quite unremarkable. I doubted you were one of them. You are a person of little note. I'm sure Grace and Elizabeth made their way to the top of the list, because whoever directs the Sisters of the Dark considered them expendable. I direct the Sisters of the Light. I chose you for the same reason. There are sisters who are valuable to our cause. I could not risk one of them on such a task. The boy may prove a value to us, but he is not as important as other matters at the palace. It was simply an opportunity I thought to take. If there had been trouble, and none of you made it back, well, I'm sure you can understand that a general would not want to lose his best troops on a low-priority mission. The woman who had smiled at her when she was little, filling her with inspiration, had broken her heart. Verna drew the comforter up as she blinked at the watery walls of the sanctuary. All she had ever wanted was to be a sister of the light. She had wanted to be one of those wondrous women who used her gift to do the Creator's work here in this world. She had given her life and her heart to the Palace of the Prophets. Verna remembered the day they came and told her that her mother had died. Old age, they said. Her mother didn't have the gift, and so was of no use to the palace. Her mother didn't live close, and Verna only rarely saw her. When her mother did travel to the palace for a visit, she was frightened because Verna didn't age to her eyes the way a normal person aged. She could never understand it, no matter how many times Verna tried to explain the spell. Verna knew it was because her mother feared to really listen. She feared magic. Though the sisters made no attempt to conceal the existence of the spell about the palace that slowed their aging, people without the gift had difficulty fathoming it. It was magic that had no meaning to their lives. The people were proud to live near the palace, near its splendor and might, and although they viewed the palace with reverence, that reverence was edged with fearful caution. They didn't dare to focus their minds on things of such power, much the same way as they enjoyed the warmth of the sun, but didn't dare to stare at it. When her mother died, Verna had been at the palace for 47 years, yet appeared to have aged only to adolescence. Verna remembered the day they came and told her that Laetus, her daughter, had died. Old age, they said. Verna's daughter, Jedediah's daughter, didn't have the gift, and so was of no use to the palace. It would be better, they said, if she were raised by a family who would love her and give her a normal life. A life at the palace was no life for one without the gift. Verna had the Creator's work to do, and so acquiesced. Joining the gift of the male and the female created a better, though still remote, chance of the offspring being born with the gift. Thus, sisters and wizards could look forward to approval, if not official encouragement, should they conceive a child. As for the arrangement the palace always made in such circumstances, Leotis didn't know that the people who raised her weren't her real parents. Verna guessed it was for the best. What kind of mother could a sister of the light be? 
The palace had provided for the family to ensure Verna wouldn't worry for her daughter's well-being. Several times Verna had visited, as a sister merely bringing the Creator's blessing to a family of honest, hard-working people, and Leotis had seemed happy. The last time Verna had visited, Leotis had been gray and stooped and was able to walk only with the aid of a cane. Leotis didn't remember Verna as the same sister who had visited when she was playing Catch the Fox with her young friends sixty years before. Leotis had smiled at Verna, at the blessing, and said, Thank you, sister, so talented for one so young. How are you, Leotis? Have you a good life? Verna's daughter smiled distantly. Oh, sister, I've had a long and happy life. My husband died five years ago, but other than that, the Creator has blessed me. She had chuckled. I only wish I still had my curly brown hair. It was once as lovely as yours, yes it was, I swear it. Dear Creator, how long had it been since Leotis had passed on? It had to be fifty years. Leotis had had children, but Verna had scrupulously avoided learning so much as their names. The lump in her throat as she wept was nearly choking her. She had given so much to be a sister. She had just wanted to help people. She had never asked for anything, and she had been played a fool. She hadn't wanted to be prelate, but she was just beginning to think she could use the post to better the lives of people, to do the work for which she had sacrificed everything. Instead, she was again being played for a fool. Verna clutched the comforter to herself as she cried in racking sobs until the light was long gone from the little windows in the peaks, and her throat was raw. In the heart of the night, she finally decided to go to her bed. She didn't want to stay in the prelate's sanctuary. It only seemed to be mocking her. She was not the prelate. She had finally exhausted all her tears and felt only numb humiliation. She couldn't get the door to open and had to crawl around on the floor until she found the prelate's ring. After she had closed the door, she put the ring back on her finger, a reminder, a beacon of the dupe she was. She shuffled woodenly into the prelate's office, on her way to the prelate's bed. The candle had guttered and gone out, so she lit another on the desk still stacked with waiting reports. Phoebe worked hard at seeing to it that it stayed that way. What was Phoebe going to think when she found out that she wasn't really the prelate's administrator, that she had been appointed by a quite unremarkable sister of little note? Tomorrow she would have to apologize to Warren. This wasn't his fault. She shouldn't take it out on him. Just before she went through the door to the outer office, she stopped in her tracks. Her diaphanous shield was shredded. She looked back at the desk. No new reports had been added to the piles. Someone had been snooping around. Chapter 26 Sheets of rain raked the deck of the ship. The barefoot men crouched, tense and ready, their bulging muscles glistening in the faint yellow lamplight as they watched the distance close, and then with a sudden burst of effort, they leapt into the darkness. After they landed, they sprang up to catch the lead-weighted fists at the ends of light heaving lines, lofted across the murky chasm after them. Hand over hand, the men hauled across the heavy docking lines attached to the heaving lines. Moving with swift efficiency, they looped the wrist-thick dock lines around the massive pilings, planted their feet, and bent their backs against the drag using the pilings for purchase. Wet wood creaked and groaned as the lines took up the tension. The rows of men straining against the burden gave ground until they brought the slow but seemingly inexorable headway of the Lady Sifa to a halt. Grunting in unison, they began taking back the ground they had yielded, and the ship slowly drew toward the rain-slicked pier as men aboard dropped bundled rope fenders over the side to protect the hull. Sister Ulyssia, bunched together with sisters Tovi, Cecilia, Armina, Nietzsche, and Marissa, under a tarp drumming in the pelting rain, watched as Captain Blake paced the deck, angrily shouting orders at men running to see them carried out. He hadn't wanted to bring the Lady Sifa into the narrow wharf in such weather, to say nothing of the dark, but instead to anchor in the harbor and bring the women ashore in the longboat. Ulyssia was in no mood to be drenched as they were rowed a half mile to shore, and had summarily dismissed his pleas about having to launch all the boats to tow the ship in with the sweeps. One glare had cut off his reiteration of the dangers, and sent him tight-lipped to the task. The captain snatched his sodden hat from his head as he stopped before them. We'll have you ashore shortly, ladies. 
It didn't appear as difficult as you made it out to be, Captain, Ulysses said. He wrung his hat. We got her in. Though why you'd want to come way down the coast to Graffin Harbor is beyond me. Getting back to Tanamura over land from this forsaken army outpost is not going to be the ease it would have been had you let us take you straight there by sea. He left unsaid that it would have had them off his ship days sooner, which was undoubtedly the reason he had offered, with effusive graciousness, to take them straight back to Tanamura as they had originally wanted. Ulyssia would have liked nothing better, but she had had no choice in the matter. She had done as she was ordered. She peered up beyond the wharf to where she knew he waited. Her companion's eyes, too, stared into the same darkness. The hills overlooking the harbor were visible only in the crackling flashes of lightning appearing suddenly out of the void, and except when the lightning sporadically revealed the lay of the high ground, the feeble glow of lights coming from the massive stone fortress hunkered high on a distant hill appeared to be floating in the inky sky. Only in the brief illumination could she see the bleak, rain-slicked stone walls. Jagang was there. Being before him in the dream was one thing. She could eventually wake. But being before him in the flesh was quite another. There would be no waking now. She clutched the link tighter to herself. For Jagang, there was going to be no waking either. Her true master would have him and make him pay. Looks like you're expected. Ulyssia snatched herself from her thoughts and redirected her attention to the captain. What? He pointed with his hat. That coach must be for you ladies. There sure enough isn't anyone else about, but all those soldiers. Staring off into the gloom, she finally saw the black coach with its team of six huge geldings waiting on the road at the top of the wall above the wharf. Its door stood open. Ulyssia had to remind herself to let the breath go from her lungs. It would be over soon. Jagang would pay. They had only to see it through. Once her eyes had recognized the still dark shapes, she was able to begin picking out soldiers. They were everywhere. Fires dotted the closer hills all about the harbor, and she knew that for every fire that managed to burn in the pouring rain, there were twenty or thirty that wouldn't catch flame. Without counting the fires she could see, she could easily tell there were hundreds. The gangway rumbled across the deck as the sailors slid it out through the opening in the bulwark. With a dull thud, one end dropped on the dock. As soon as it touched down, sailors trotted down the plank with the sisters' baggage and headed up the pier toward the coach. It's been a pleasure doing business with you, sister, Captain Blake lied. He fumbled with his hat as he waited for them to be on their way. He turned to the men on the lines. Stand ready to slip the lines, lads. We don't want to lose the tide. No cheer went up, but only because they feared the result were they to show their happiness to be rid of their passengers. On their sea voyage back to the old world, it had been necessary to measure out a few more lessons in discipline, lessons not one of them would ever forget. As they waited silently for the order to cast off, none of the sailors so much as glanced at the six women. At the end of the gangway, four men stood in readiness, eyes fixed on the ground, each gripping a pole supporting the corner of a canvas tarp to hold over the sisters' heads to keep them from being drenched. With as much power as was crackling around Ulyssia and her five companions, she could easily have used the Han to shield herself and her five sisters from the rain, but she didn't want to use the link until it was time. She didn't want to take a chance by giving Jagang any warning. Besides, it pleased her to make these insignificant worms carry the tarp over their heads. They were all lucky she didn't want to reveal the link or she would have slaughtered the lot of them, slowly. As Ulyssia started moving, she could feel each of her sisters move too. Each of them had not only the gift they were born with, the female Han, but each had been through the ritual, and each also possessed its opposite, the male Han they had appropriated from young wizards. Besides the additive gift they were born with, each also possessed its opposite, subtractive magic. And now it was all linked. Ulyssia had not been sure it would work. Sisters of the Dark, and beyond that, Sisters of the Dark, who had also succeeded in absorbing the male Han, had never before attempted to link their power. It had been a dangerous risk. But the alternative was unacceptable. That it worked had given them all a heady flush of relief. That it had worked beyond their wildest hopes left Ulyssia intoxicated with the swift and violent flux of magic coursing through her. She had never suspected such awesome power could be gathered. 
Short of the creator or the keeper, there was no power on the face of the earth that could approach what they now controlled. Ulyssia was the Link's dominant node, and the one who would command and direct the force. It was all she could do to contain the inner blaze of Han. Wherever her gaze settled, it howled to be released. Soon enough, it would be. Linked as they were, the female and male Han, the additive and subtractive magic, they had enough destructive force to make wizard's fire seem a candle by comparison. With a mere thought, she could level the hill atop which sat the fortress. With a mere thought, she could instantly level everything in the range of her sight and possibly beyond. If she could be sure Jagang was in the fortress, she would have already unleashed the cataclysmic fury. But if he wasn't, and they failed to find and kill him before they fell asleep again, then he would have them. First, they must face him to be sure he was there, and then she would release such power as had never been seen in this world and turn Jagang to dust before he could blink. Her master would have his soul then and see to it that Jagang's punishment went on without end. At the end of the gangway, the four sailors moved around them, sheltering them from the rain. Ulyssia could feel the muscles in each of her sisters flex as they moved up the pier. Through the link, she could feel each little ache or pain or pleasure they felt. In her mind, they were one. In her mind, they were of one thought, one need, to rid themselves of this leech of a man. Soon enough, sisters, soon enough. And then we go after the seeker? Yes, sisters, and then we go after the seeker. As they marched up the pier, a squad of grisly-looking soldiers trotted past in the opposite direction, their weapons clanging as they went. They ran up the slippery gangway without pause. The squad's corporal came to a halt before the blustering ship's captain. She couldn't hear the soldiers' words, but she saw Captain Blake throw his arms up, and she could hear him scream, What? The captain angrily threw down his hat and started a flurry of objections she couldn't make out. Had she extended the link, she would be able to, but she didn't dare risk it yet. The soldiers drew steel. Captain Blake planted his fists on his hips and after a short pause, turned to the men on the dock. Make the lines fast, boys, he yelled down at them. We're not leaving tonight. When Ulyssia reached the coach, a soldier held his hand out, commanding them to enter. Ulyssia let the others climb in first. She could feel the comfort of the weight coming off the legs of the two older women as they sat on the thinly padded leather seat. The soldier ordered the four sailors that had accompanied them to stand to the side and wait. As she stepped in and pulled the door closed, Ulyssia saw the soldiers on the ship herding all the sailors from the Lady Sifa down the gangway. Emperor Jagang probably intended to kill them to eliminate any witnesses to connect him with Sisters of the Dark. Jagang was doing her a favor. He would not get the chance to kill the ship's crew, of course, but since the sailors were not being allowed to leave, she would. She smiled at her sisters. Through the link, they each knew her thoughts. Each of the other five returned a satisfied smile. Their sea voyage had been miserable. The sailors would pay. On the slow ride to the fortress, as they gained a rise, Ulyssia was surprised to see, when the lightning flashed, the extent of the army Jagang had gathered. Every time the lightning thundered through the hills, she could see tents as far as there was land. They covered the rolling hills like blades of grass in spring. Their numbers made the city of Tanamura seem a village. She had not known there were this many men-at-arms in the whole of the old world. Well, perhaps they too would be useful. When the forks of lightning ripped under the boiling clouds and shook the ground, she could see too the grim fortress where Jagang waited. Through the link, she could see the fortress through their eyes too and could feel their fear. They all wanted to blast that hilltop into oblivion, but every one of them knew that they couldn't, not yet. There would be no mistaking Jagang when they saw him. None of them could fail to recognize that smirking face, but they had to see him first to be certain. When we see him, sisters, and know he is there, then he will die. Ulyssia wanted to see fear in that man's eyes, the kind of fear he had put in their hearts, but she dared not risk giving him any indication of what they were about to do. Ulyssia didn't know what he was capable of. They had, after all, never before been visited in the dream that was not a dream by any but their master, the Keeper. And she was not about to take the slightest chance by giving him any warning, just for the satisfaction of seeing him quake. She had deliberately waited until they were sailing into Graffin Harbor before she revealed her plan to her sisters, just to be safe. 
their master would see to Jagang's punishment. It was their job to simply deliver his soul to the underworld and into the keeper's grasp. The keeper would be more than pleased when they restored his power in this world and would reward them with a view of Jagang's torment should they wish it. And they would wish it. The coach lurched to a halt before the imposing maw of the fortress. The women were ordered out of the coach by a burly soldier wearing a hide mantle and enough weapons to single-handedly slaughter a good-sized army. The six of them marched silently through the rain and mud and in under the barreled roof beyond the iron portcullis. They were led into a dark entryway where they were told to stand and wait, as if any of them had any intention of sitting on the filthy cold stone floor. They were, after all, wearing their finest dresses. Tovi in a dark dress, slimming to her size. Cecilia, her brushed and neat gray hair complementing her deep green dress, banded with lace at the collar. Nietzsche in a simple dress, black as her dresses always were, laced at the bodice in a way that accented the shape of her bosom. Marissa in a red dress, a color she favored, and with good reason, the way it set off her thick mane of dark hair, to say nothing of exhibiting her exquisite form. Armina, in a dark blue dress that revealed her reasonably shaped figure and went well with her sky-blue eyes, and Ulyssia, in her own becoming attire, a shade of blue much lighter than Armina's, and trimmed with tasteful ruffles at her cleavage and wrists, and unadorned at the waist so as not to hide her well-formed hips. They all wanted to look their best when they killed Jagang. The block stone walls of the room were bare of everything but two hissing torches in brackets. As they waited, Ulyssia could feel the anger of each of the others rising, along with hers, and, too, their collective apprehension. When the sailors, surrounded by soldiers, came through the portcullis, one of the two guards in the stone room opened the inner door into the fortress, and with a rude tilt of his head, ordered the sisters through. The corridors were as austere as the entry room had been. This was an armed fortress, not a palace after all, and it made no pretension of comfort. As they followed their guards, Ulyssia saw no more than crude wooden benches and torches set in rusty iron brackets. Doors were rough planks with iron strap hinges, and there was not so much as a single oil lamp to be seen as they worked their way into the heart of the stronghold. It appeared little more than barracks for troops. The guards came to a large double door and turned their backs to the stone at each side after opening the doors. One of them pompously lifted a thumb, ordering them into the great room beyond. Ulyssia vowed to her sisters that she would remember his face and he would pay the price for his arrogance. Ulyssia led the other five women in as the sailors came up the hall behind, accompanied by the echo of boots on stone and the clatter of the weapons of the men guarding them. The room was huge. Windows without glass high up on the walls revealed the lightning outside and let the rain run down the dark stone in glistening rivulets. A pit to each side of the floor held roaring fires. Their sparks and churning smoke ascended to billow out the open windows, but still left a reeking haze to hang in the air. In a ring of rusted brackets around the room, torches spit and hissed, adding the smell of pitch to the stink of sweat. Everything in the dim room flickered in the firelight. Between the twin crackling fires, they could see in the gloom beyond a massive planked table set with a wealth of food. Only one man sat at the table, on the opposite side, casually watching them as he sawed off a chunk of roasted suckling pig. In the murky flickering light, it was hard to be sure. They had to be sure. Behind the table against the wall stood a row of people who were obviously not soldiers. The men wore white trousers and nothing else. The women wore baggy-legged garments running from ankle to neck to wrist and cinched at the waist with a white cord. Except for the cord, the outfits were so sheer that the barefoot women might as well have been naked. The man raised his hand and waggled his first two fingers, ordering them forward. The six women advanced across the cavernous room that, because of its dark stone that swallowed the firelight, seemed to close in about them. On an enormous bearskin before the table sat two more of the absurdly clad slaves. The women behind the table, against the wall, stood hands at their sides, bodies stiff and unmoving. Each of the young women had a gold ring pierced through the center of her lower lip. The fires behind them popped and snapped as the six sisters advanced into the gloom. One of the men in white trousers poured wine into a mug for the man when he held it out to his side. None of the slaves looked at the six women. Their attention was on the man sitting alone at the table. 
Ulyssia and her sisters all recognized him now. Jagang. He was of average height, but stout, with massive arms and chest. His bare shoulders bulged from a fur vest opened in the middle, displaying a few dozen gold and jeweled chains lying against the hair in the deep cleft between his prodigious chest muscles. The chains and jewels looked to have once belonged to kings and queens. Silver bands encircled his arms above bulky biceps. Each of his thick fingers bore a gold or silver ring. Each of the sisters knew well the pain those powerful fingers could inflict. His shaved head gleamed in the fluttering firelight. It matched his brawn. Ulyssia couldn't imagine him with hair atop his head. It could only diminish his menace. His neck looked like it belonged to a bull. A gold ring in the flare of his left nostril held a thin gold chain running to another ring at mid-height in his left ear. He was clean-shaven except for a two-inch braid of mustache growing only above the corners of his smirk and another braid in the center under his lower lip. His eyes, though, were what riveted anyone upon whom they settled. There were no whites to them at all. They were a murky gray, clouded over with sullen, dusky shapes that shifted in a field of inky obscurity, yet there was no doubt whatsoever as to when he was looking at you. They were twin windows into nightmare. The smirk departed, leaving in its place a treacherous glare. You're late, he said in a deep grating voice that they each recognized as readily as his nightmare eyes. Ulyssia wasted no time with a reply, nor did she betray any indication of what she was about to do. Twisting the flow of Han, she even controlled their hatred, allowing only one facet of their feelings, fear, to touch their faces, lest they give him any warning of their confidence and betray a reason for it. Ulyssia committed to obliterating everything from her toes outward for the next twenty miles. With violent and unceremonious abruptness, she yanked the restraining blocks from the furious force bottled behind it. As quick as thought, with thundering fury, the additive and subtractive magic exploded outward in a murderous blast. The very air howled as it burned. The room ignited with a blinding flash of twin magics, opposites that twisted in a deafening discharge of wrath. Even Ulyssia was stunned at what she had unleashed. The fabric of reality seemed to rip. Her last thought was that surely she had destroyed the entire world. Chapter 27 Like snowflake patches of a dark dream drifting down, everything came slowly back into her vision. The twin fires first, then the torches, then the dark stone walls, and finally the people. Her whole body was numb for a stunned moment before the feeling returned to her flesh in a million painful pinpricks. She hurt everywhere. Jagang tore off a big bite of roast pheasant. He chewed a moment and then wagged the leg bone at her. You know your problem, Ulyssia, he asked, still chewing. You use magic that you can unleash as quick as a thought. The smirk returned to his greasy lips. I, on the other hand, am a dreamwalker. I use the time between fragments of thought. In that stillness, when there is nothing to do what I do, I slip in where no other can go. He gestured with the bone again as he swallowed. You see, for me, in that space between thought, time is infinite and I can do as I wish. You might as well be stone statues trying to chase me. Ulyssia felt her sisters through the link. It was still there. Crude, very crude, he said. I've seen others do it much better, but then they'd been practiced at it. I left the link for now. For now, I want you all to feel each other. I'll break it later. Just as I can break the link, I can break your minds too. He took a gulp of wine. But I think that's so unproductive. How can you teach people a lesson, really teach them a lesson if their minds don't understand it? Through the link, Ulyssia felt Cecilia lose control of her bladder and the warm urine running down her legs. How? Ulyssia heard herself ask in a hollow voice. How can you use the time between thoughts? Jagang picked up his knife and sliced off a slab of meat on an ornate silver platter to his side. He stabbed the bloody center of the slice with the knife point and then rested his elbows on the table. 
What are we all? He waved around the skewered hunk of meat as it dripped red down his knife. What is reality? The reality of our existence? He drew the meat off the knife with his teeth and chewed as he went on. Are we our bodies? Is a small person less than a big person then? If we were our bodies, then when we lost an arm or a leg, would we be less? Would we begin to fade from existence? No, we are the same person. We are not our bodies, we are our thoughts. As they form, they define who we are. And create the reality of our existence. Between those thoughts, there is nothing, simply the body, waiting for our thoughts to make us who we are. Between your thoughts I come. In that space between your thoughts, time has no meaning to you, but it has meaning to me. He took a swig of wine. I am a shadow slipping between the cracks of your existence. Through the link, Ulyssia could feel the others trembling. That isn't possible, she whispered. Your Han can't spread time, break it apart. His condescending smile caught her breath short. A small, simple wedge inserted into a crack in the largest, most massive boulder can split it apart, destroy it. I am that wedge. That wedge is now hammered into the cracks in your minds. She stood silently as his thumb gouged off a long strip of pork from a roasted suckling pig. When you sleep, your thoughts float and drift and you are vulnerable. When you sleep, you are a beacon I can find. Then my thoughts slip into the cracks. The spaces where you fade in and out of existence are chasms to me. And... What do you want with us? Armin asked. He tore off a bite of the pork dangling from his meaty fingers. Well, among my uses for you, we have a mutual enemy, Richard Rahl. You know him as Richard Cipher. He arched an eyebrow over one of his dark, seething eyes. The Seeker. Up until now, he's been invaluable. He did me a huge favor by destroying the barrier which kept me on this side. My body, anyway. You, the Sisters of the Dark, the Keeper, and Richard Rahl made it possible for me to bring the race of man to ascendancy. We have done no such thing, Toby protested in a meek voice. Ah, but you have. You see, the Creator and the Keeper vied for dominance in this world. The Creator simply to prevent the Keeper from swallowing it into the world of the dead, and the Keeper simply because he has an insatiable appetite for the living. His inky-eyed gaze rose to meet theirs. In your struggle to free the Keeper, to give him this world, you gave the Keeper power here, and that in turn baited Richard Rawl to come to the defense of the living. He restored the balance. In that balance, just as in the space between your thoughts, I come. Magic is the conduit to those other worlds, giving them power here. By reducing the amount of magic in the world, I will lessen the Creator and the Keeper's influence here. The Keeper will still send his spark of life, and the Keeper will still take it away when its end has come. But beyond that, the world will belong to man. The old religion of magic will be consigned to the midden heap of history, and eventually to myth. I am a dreamwalker. I have seen the dreams of men. I know their potential. Magic suppresses these boundless visions. Without magic, man's mind, his imagination, will be unleashed and he will be all-powerful. That's why I have the army I do. When magic is dead, I will still have them. I keep them well practiced for that day. And how is Richard Roll your enemy? Ulyssia asked, hoping to keep him talking while she tried to think of what they could do. He had to do as he did, of course, or you darlings would have given the world to the Keeper. That aided me. But now he interferes with my plans. He's young and ignorant of his talents. I, on the other hand, have spent the last twenty years perfecting my ability. He waved the knife point in front of his eyes. Only in the last year have my eyes turned the mark of a dreamwalker. Only now am I entitled to the most feared appellation in the ancient world. In the ancient tongue, Dreamwalker is synonymous with weapon. 
The wizards who created this weapon came to regret it. He licked the grease off his knife as he watched them. It's a mistake to forge weapons with minds of their own. You are my weapons now. I don't make the same mistake. My power allows me to enter the minds of anyone when they sleep. In those who don't have the gift, I can only exert a limited amount of influence, and they are of small use to me anyway. But in those who are gifted like you six, I can do anything I wish. Once my wedge is in your mind, it is no longer yours, it is mine. The magic of the Dreamwalkers was powerful but unstable. None has been born with the ability in the last 3,000 years since the barrier went up and trapped us here. But now, a Dreamwalker treads this world again. He shook with a menacing chuckle. The tiny braids at the corners of his mouth danced. That would be me. Ulyssia almost told him to get to the point, but stopped herself just in time. She had no desire to see what he would do when he was done talking. She needed the time to try to think of something. How do you know all this? Jagang tore a strip of charred fat from the roast and nibbled on it as he went on. In a buried city in my homeland of Alterang, I found an archive from the ancient times. Ironic the value of books to a warrior like me. The Palace of the Prophets has books of immense value, too, if you know how to use them. Too bad the Prophet died, but I have other wizards. A fragment of magic from the ancient war, a shield of sorts, was passed down from its originator to all those descendants with the gift born to the House of Rall. This bond shields people's minds, so I can't enter. Richard Rall has that ability and has begun to use it. Before he learns too much, he must be brought to task, along with his betrothed. He paused with a distant, brooding look. The Mother Confessor dealt me a small setback, but she's been brought to task by my unwitting puppets up north. The fools in their zeal have created some complications, but I have yet to truly jerk their strings. When I do, they'll jump to my tune. I have that wedge planted deep. I've spent great effort to bend events to my advantage so as to put Richard Rawl and the Mother Confessor in the palm of my hand. He squeezed a fist of meat from the roasted suckling pig. You see, he's been born a war wizard, the first in 3,000 years. But then you knew that. A wizard like that will prove an invaluable weapon to me. He can do things none of you can, so I don't want to kill him. I want to control him. When he's outlived his usefulness, then he'll need killing. Jagang sucked the pig fat from his rings. You see, control is more important than killing. I could have killed you six, but then what good would you be? As long as you're under my dominion, you're no threat to me, and of use in oh so many ways. Jagang turned his wrist up, pointing his knife at Marissa. You all vowed vengeance against him. But you, my darling, have vowed to bathe in his blood. I may yet give you the chance. Marissa's face paled. How could you know that? I said that when I was awake. He chuckled at the look of panic on her face. If you don't want me to know something, darling, then you shouldn't dream about what you've said while you were awake. Through the link, Ulyssia felt Armina come near to fainting. Of course, you six must first be brought to task. You must learn who it is that's in control of your lives. With his knife, he indicated the silent slaves behind him. You'll become as obedient as these here. For the first time, Ulyssia took a good look at the partially clad people around the room. She nearly gasped aloud. The women were all sisters. Worse, most were her sisters of the dark. She took a quick survey. Not all of them were here. The men, mostly young wizards who had been released after their training at the palace, were also ones who had given a sole oath to the Keeper. Some are sisters of the light and serve well for fear of what I'll visit upon them should they displease me. With a finger and thumb, Jagang stroked the thin gold chain between the rings in his nose and ear. But I like your sisters of the dark the best. I've brought them all to task, even those at the palace. Ulyssia felt as if another pin had been knocked from under her. I have business at the Palace of the Prophets. Important business. 
The gold chains at his chest glinted at the firelight as he spread his arms. They're all quite obedient. His inky gaze turned to those behind. Aren't you, my darlings? Janet, a sister of the light, kissed her ring finger as tears crept down her cheeks. Jagang laughed. His rings sparkled in the firelight as he pointed a thick finger at her. See that? I permit her to do that. It keeps her filled with false hope. Would I prevent it, then she might kill herself, because she doesn't have the fear of death like those sworn to the keeper. Isn't that right, my darling Janet? Yes, Excellency, she answered in a cowed voice. You own my body in this life, but my soul belongs to the Creator when I die. Jagang laughed, a morbid grating sound. Ulyssia had heard it before, and she knew she was going to be its cause again. You see, that's what I tolerate in order to maintain my control. Of course, she will now have to serve a week in the tents as punishment. His inky glare caused Janet to shrink back. But then you knew that before you said it, didn't you, my darling? Sister Janet's voice trembled. Yes, Excellency. Jagang's murky, clouded eyes returned to the six before him. I like the Sisters of the Dark best, because they have sound reason to fear death. He twisted the pheasant in half. Bones snapped and popped. They've failed the keeper to whom they've sworn their souls. If they die, it's no escape. If they die, the keeper will have his revenge for their failure. He laughed, a deep resonant mocking sound. As he'll have you six for eternity if you displease me enough to earn death. Ulyssia swallowed. We understand, Excellency. Jagang's nightmare gaze made her forget to breathe. Oh, no, Ulyssia, I don't think you truly do. When your lessons are finished, though, you will. With his nightmare gaze on Ulyssia, he reached under the table and dragged a shapely woman out by her blonde hair. She winced in pain as his powerful fist lifted her. She was dressed the same as the others. Through the sheer fabric, Ulyssia could see older yellow bruises and newer purple ones. There was a bruise on her right cheek, and a fresh, huge, blue-black one on her left jaw, with a line of four cuts left by his rings. It was Christabel, one of the Sisters of the Dark Ulyssia had left at the palace. The Sisters of the Dark at the palace were to have laid the groundwork for their return. Apparently, they now laid the groundwork for Jagang's arrival. What he could want with the Palace of the Prophets, she couldn't fathom. Jagang turned his hand over, pointing. Stand before me. Sister Christabel scurried around the table to stand before Jagang. She quickly smoothed her disheveled hair and wiped her mouth with the back of her hand before bowing. How may I serve you, Excellency? Well, Christabel, I need to teach these six their first lesson. He tore the other leg off the pheasant. In order to do that, you must die. She bowed. Yes, Excellency. She froze, realizing what he had just said. Ulyssia could see her legs trembling as she straightened, but still the woman dared say nothing. He gestured with a pheasant leg to the two women sitting before him on the bearskin, and they scrambled away. Jagang smiled that terrifying smirk of his. Goodbye, Christabel. Her arms flung into the air as she collapsed to the ground with a shriek. Christabel thrashed madly on the floor, screamed so loudly it hurt Ulyssia's ears. The six women standing above her at the edge of the bearskin watched with wide eyes, holding their breath. Jagang gnawed on his pheasant leg. The blood-curdling screams went on and on as Christabel's head whipped from side to side, and her whole body flopped and bounced as she twitched violently. Jagang occupied himself with his pheasant leg and having his wine mug refilled. No one spoke as he finished the leg and turned to take a few grapes. Ulyssia could stand it no longer. How long until she dies? She asked in a hoarse voice. Jagang lifted an eyebrow. Until she dies? He threw his head back as he roared in laughter. His fists, bristling with huge rings, pounded the table. No one else in the room so much as smiled. His burly body shook. The thin chain between his nose and ear danced as his laughter died out in fits. She was dead before she hit the floor. What? But she, she's still screaming. Christabel suddenly was silent, her chest as still as stone. She's been dead from the first instant, Jagang said. 
A slow smile spread on his lips as he fixed the black void of his gaze on Ulyssia. That wedge I told you about, just like the one I have in your minds. What you see is her soul screaming. You are seeing her torment in the world of the dead. The Keeper looks to be displeased with his sister of the dark. Jagang lifted a finger and Christabel resumed her wild thrashing and screaming. Ulyssia swallowed. How long, how long until she stops? He licked his lips. Until she rots. Age 236. Ulyssia felt her knees trembling. And through the link, she could feel the other five on the verge of screaming in mad panic, just as Christabel was. This was the displeasure the Keeper would visit upon them if they didn't restore his influence in this world. Jagang snapped his fingers. Slith! Iris! Light shimmered against the wall. Ulyssia gasped as two caped forms seemed to appear out of the dark stone. The two scaled creatures glided silently around the table and bowed. Yes! Dreams Walker. Jagang waggled his thick finger, indicating the screaming woman on the floor. Throw her down the privy pit. The Mariswith flipped their capes back over their shoulders and bent, lifting the thrashing, shrieking body of a woman Ulyssia had known for well over a hundred years. A woman who had helped her and been an obedient servant to the Keeper's wishes. She was to have had a reward for her service. They all were. Ulyssia looked to Jagang as the two Mriswith left the room with their load for the privy pit. What do you want us to do? Jagang lifted a hand and with two grease-slicked fingers motioned a soldier at the side of the room to come forward. These six belong to me. Ring them. The husky man, draped in furs and hung with weapons, bowed. He went to the closest, Nietzsche, and with filthy fingers unceremoniously pulled on her lower lip, distending it grotesquely. Her wide blue eyes filled with panic. Ulyssia gasped with Nietzsche. Through the link she could feel the young woman's stunned pain and terror as the blunt, rusty iron pick stabbed with a twisting motion through the margin of the lip. The soldier stuck the wooden-handled pick back in his belt and pulled a gold ring from his pocket as he held out her lower lip. With the help of his teeth, he spread the split in the ring and then shoved it through the bleeding wound. He twisted the ring around and used his teeth to close the gap. The unshaven, filthy, stinking soldier came to Ulyssia last. By then, she was shuddering uncontrollably, having felt it done to each of the others. As he yanked on her lower lip, she desperately tried to think of an escape. It was like drawing a bucket from an empty well. Tears of pain flooded from her eyes as the ring was poked through. Jagang wiped grease from his mouth with the back of his hand while he watched with amusement as blood trickled down all their chins. You six are my slaves now. If you don't give me cause to kill you, I have use for you at the Palace of the Prophets. When I'm finished with Richard Rall, I may even let you kill him. His eyes came up again, the sullen shapes in them shifting in a way that caught her breath. All traces of mirth vanished, leaving unbridled menace in its place. But first... I'm not finished with your lessons. We understand quite well our alternatives, Ulyssia said hurriedly. Please, you have no need to fear our loyalty. Oh, I know that, Jagang whispered. But I still haven't finished with your lessons. Your first one was only the beginning. The rest won't be nearly so quick. Ulyssia's legs were in danger of giving way. Since Jagang had begun coming into her dreams, her waking life had turned into a nightmare. There must be a way to stop this, but she could think of none. She had a vision of herself returning to the Palace of the Prophets as one of Jagang's slaves in one of those outfits. Jagang glanced past her. Have you boys been listening? Ulyssia heard Captain Blake answer that they had. She started. She had forgotten all about the thirty sailors standing behind her at the back of the room. Jagang gestured with two fingers for them to come closer. In the morning... You may leave. I thought, though, that for tonight you would like to have these ladies. Each of the six went rigid. But her words were cut short by the way the floating shapes shifted suddenly in his murky eyes. From now on, if you use your magic against my wishes, even if it's to stop yourself from sneezing, you'll share Christabel's fate. 
In your dreams, I've shown you a small taste of what I can do to you while you're alive. And you've now seen a small taste of what the Keeper will do to you if you die. You have but one path to tread. If I were you, I'd not put one foot wrong. Jagang returned his gaze to the sailors behind them. They're yours for the night. Knowing these six from their dreams, I know you have scores to settle. Do to them as you wish. The sailors' voices rose in gleeful oaths. Through the link, Ulyssia could feel a hand grip Armina's breast, another pull Nietzsche's head back by her hair as the lace at her bodice was pulled loose, and another hand slide up the inside of her own thigh. She choked back a scream. There's some minor rules, Jagang said, stopping the hands on them. If you violate them, I'll gut you all like a sack of fish. And what would the rules be, Emperor? A sailor asked. You can't kill them. They're my slaves. They belong to me. I want them returned in the morning in good enough condition so that they can serve me. That means no broken bones and such. You'll draw lots as to which one you get. I know what'll happen if I let you choose for yourselves. I don't want any of them neglected. The sailors all chuckled in agreement, and all spoke up that it was more than fair. They vowed the rules would be followed. Jagang returned his attention to the six women. I have a gigantic army of big, burly soldiers and nowhere near enough whores to go around. Puts my men in an ugly mood. Until I have other duties for you, you'll serve in that capacity for all but four hours a day. Be thankful you have my ring in your lip. It'll keep them from killing you while they're having their fun. Sister Cecilia spread her hands. She glowed with a kindly, innocent smile. Emperor Jagang. Your men are young and strong. I'm afraid they would find no enjoyment being with an old woman such as myself. I'm sorry. I'm sure they'll grin with delight to have you. You'll see. Emperor Sister Cecilia is right. I'm afraid I too am too old and fat, Toby said in her best elderly voice. We would bring your men no satisfaction. Satisfaction? He took a bite of the roast on the point of his knife. Satisfaction? Are you daft? This has nothing to do with satisfaction. I assure you, my men will enjoy your warm charms. But you misunderstand. He waggled a finger at them, the greasy rings on his fingers glinting in the firelight. You six were sisters of the light and then sisters of the dark. You are probably the most powerful sorceresses in the world. This is to teach you that you're little more than dung beneath my boots. I'll do with you as I wish. Those with the gift are my weapons now. This is to teach you a lesson. You have no say in it. Until I decide otherwise, I give you to my men to use. If they want to twist your fingers and take bets on who can make you scream the loudest, then they will. If they want any other sort of pleasure from you, then they'll have it. They have quite varied tastes, and as long as they don't kill you, they're free to indulge them. He shoved the rest of the piece of meat in his mouth. After these fellows are done with you, anyway. Enjoy my gift, boys. Do as I ask, follow my rules, and I may have use of you in the future. Emperor Jagang treats his friends well. A cheer for the emperor went up from the sailors. Ulyssia would have fallen when her legs buckled had not an arm circled her waist to pull her back tight against an eager sailor. She could smell his foul breath. Well, 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 lass. Looks like you ladies are going to come out to play after all and after you were so nasty to us. Ulyssia could hear herself whimper. Her lip throbbed in pain, but she knew it was only the beginning. She was so stunned by what was happening that she couldn't form a clear thought. Oh! Jagang said, stopping everyone. He gestured with his knife to Marissa. Except that one. You can't have her, he said to the sailors. He waggled two fingers. Step forward, darling. Marissa took two strides to the fur. Through the link, Ulyssia could feel her legs trembling. Christabel was mine exclusively. She was my favorite. But she's dead now, just to serve as a lesson for you. He glanced to where the sailors had already pulled her dress open. You will take her place. He returned his inky gaze to her eyes. You did say, if I recall correctly, that you would lick my feet if you must. You must. 
At Marissa's look of surprise, Jagang smiled that deadly smile of his, framed by the little braids at the ends. I told you, darling, you dream things you've said when you're awake. Marissa nodded weakly. Yes, Excellency. Take off that dress. You might need something nice for later if I choose to let you kill Richard Rall for me. He looked to the other women as Marissa did as she was ordered. I'm going to leave the link on you for now so you can each feel the lessons the others get. I wouldn't want you to miss out on any of it. When Marissa had finished, Jagang turned the knife between a finger and thumb and pointed it down. Under the table, darling. Ulysses could feel the coarse fur rug against Marissa's knees and then the rough stone floor under the table. The sailors leered at the sight. Through sheer force of will, from her reservoir of hatred for this man, Ulysses tapped strength and drew resolve. She was the leader of the Sisters of the Dark. Through the link, she spoke to the others. We have all been through the ritual. Worse than this has been done to us. We are Sisters of the Dark. Remember who is our true master. For now, we are slaves to this leech, but he has made a huge mistake if he thinks we don't have minds. He has no power of his own except to use ours. We will think of something, and then Jagang will pay. Oh, sweet master, will he ever pay? But what are we going to do until then? Armina screamed. Silence, Nietzsche commanded. Ulysses could feel the probing fingers on Nietzsche, and she could feel the white heat of her rage, and she could feel her heart of black ice. Remember each face. They will each pay. Listen to Ulysses. We'll think of something, and then we will teach them all lessons only we could envision. And don't any of you dare dream any of this, Ulyssia warned. The one thing we cannot afford is to let your gang kill us, or all hope is lost. As long as we live, we have a chance to earn our way back into our master's favor. We've been promised a reward for our souls, and I intend to have it. Have strength, my sisters. But Richard Rahl is mine, Marissa hissed. Any who takes him in my stead will answer to me and the keeper. Even Jagang, had he been able to hear her, would have blanched at the venom in her warning. Through the link, Ulysses felt Marissa push her thick hair back out of the way. She could taste what Marissa tasted. I'm done with you. Jagang paused a moment as he drew a breath. He waved the knife. Be gone. Captain Blake snatched Ulysses by the hair. Time for payback, lass. Chapter 28 She blinked as she looked down the length of the rusty sword held at her face. The point was no more than an inch away. Really, is this necessary? I told you that you could steal what you wanted and we wouldn't do anything to stop you, but I have to tell you that you're the third band of dangerous outlaws who have robbed us in the last couple of weeks and we've nothing of value left. By the way the lad's hand was shaking, he didn't look to be very practiced at his craft. By the way his skin clung to his bones, he didn't look to be very successful at it either. Be quiet! He snuck a look in the direction of his companion. Have you found anything? The second young outlaw, squatting among the packs in the snow and as thin as the first, darted glances around at the darkening woods to each side of the little traveled road. He checked behind, to the bend in the road not far away where it vanished behind a screen of snow-crusted fir trees. In the center of the bend, just before the road vanished, was a bridge over a stream still rushing despite the fact it was winter. No, just old clothes and junk, no bacon, not even any bread. The first danced back and forth on the balls of his feet, ready to bolt at the first sign of trouble. He brought his other hand up to the hilt to help hold the weight of the poorly made sword. You look well fed. What do you two eat, old woman, snow? She folded her hands against her belt as she sighed. She was tiring of this. We work for our food as we go. You should try it. Work, I mean. Yeah? It's winter, old woman, in case you hadn't noticed. There's no work. Last autumn, the army took our stores. My parents don't have anything to get them through the winter. I'm sorry, son. Perhaps. Hey, what's this, old man? He had his finger through the dull silver collar. He gave it a yank. How do you get this off? Answer me. I told you, she said, avoiding the silent fury of the wizard's blue eyes. My brother is deaf and dumb. He doesn't understand your words, and he can't answer them. Deaf and dumb? Then you tell me, how do you get this thing off? It's just an iron memento that was welded on long ago. It's worthless. 
A hand came off the sword as her assailant leaned warily toward her and with a finger lifted her cape aside. What's this? A purse! I found her purse! He yanked the heavy bag of gold coins from her belt. It must be full of gold! She chuckled. I'm afraid it's just a bag of hard biscuits. You're free to have one if you'd like. But don't try to bite down on them or you'll break your teeth. Suck on it a while. He fished out a gold coin and put it between his teeth. He winced with a sour expression. How can you eat these things? I've eaten bad biscuits, but these aren't even good enough to be called bad. So easy with a young mind, she thought. Too bad it wasn't that easy on an adult. He spat to the side and tossed the bag of gold to the snow before patting her cape, searching for anything else she might have concealed. She sighed impatiently. Would you boys get on with this robbery? We'd like to make the next town before dark. Nothing, the second said. They don't have nothing worth the trouble of carrying off. They got horses, the first said, as he squeezed fistfuls of her heavy cape, feeling for anything it might be holding. At least we could take the horses. They'll bring something. Please do, she said. I'm tired of being slowed by leading those old nags around. You would be doing me a favor. All four are lame, and I don't have the heart to put them out of their misery. The old woman's right, the second said, as he pulled one of the limping horses along, testing it. All four. We can walk faster. We try to take these bags of bones with us and we'll get caught, sure. The first was still running his hand down her cape. It halted on her pocket. What's this? Her voice took on an edge. Nothing of interest to you. Yeah? He fingered the journey book from her pocket. As he thumbed through the blank pages, she caught sight of a message. At last. What's this? Just a notebook. Can you read, son? No. There don't appear to be hardly nothing worth reading anyway. Take it anyway, the second said. It might be worth something if nothing's written in it. She looked back to the young man holding the sword on her. I've had just about enough of this. Consider the robbery over. It's over when I say it's over. Give it back, Anne said in a level voice as she held her hand out and then be on your way before I drag you to town by your ear and have your parents come to collect you. He brandished the sword as he leapt back defensively. Look, don't you go get in feisty or you'll taste steel. I know how to use this thing. The still evening air suddenly thundered with horses' hooves. She had been watching as the soldiers had slipped up around the bend and over the little bridge, unnoticed by the two young men because of the rushing water, until at the last moment when they charged in. As her assailant turned in shock, Anne snatched the sword from his hands. Nathan snatched the knife from the other. Mounted Daharan soldiers suddenly towered above them. What's going on here? The sergeant asked in a calm, deep voice. The two young men stood frozen in panic. Well, Anne said, we ran into these two here, and they were telling us how we should be careful of outlaws. They live in the neighborhood. They were showing us how to protect ourselves and giving us a demonstration of their blade work. The sergeant folded his hands over the pommel. Is that right, boy? I, we, his pleading eyes turned to her. That's right. We live nearby, and we was just telling these two travelers to be careful as we heard tell that there are outlaws about. And quite a show of swordsmanship it was. As I promised, young man, you get a biscuit for the show. Hand me my sack of biscuits there. He bent and snatched up the heavy purse of gold, holding it out to her. Anne pulled two coins out and pressed one into the hand of each young man. As promised, a biscuit for each. Now you boys best be getting home before dark or your parents will worry. Give them my biscuit as thanks for sending you out to warn us to be careful. He nodded dumbly. All right. Good night, then. Take care of yourselves. Anne held her hand out. She fixed the young man with a dangerous squint. If you're done looking at my notebook, I'll have it back. His eyes widened at the look in hers, and then he thrust the journey book into her hand as if it were burning his fingers, which it was. Anne smiled. Thank you, son. He wiped the hand on his tattered coat. Goodbye, then, and be careful. He turned to leave. Don't forget this. He turned back cautiously. She held the hilt out to him. Your father would be awfully angry if you forgot to bring back his sword. He lifted it carefully. Nathan, not about to let this go without a bit of theatrics, walked the spinning knife across the backs of his fingers. He tossed the knife in the air, catching it behind his back, 
and then whirled it under his armpit and into his other hand. Anne rolled her eyes as he slapped the blade, reversing the spin. He caught the knife by its blade and handed it, handle first, to the other wide-eyed young man. Where'd you learn to do that, old man? The sergeant asked. Nathan scowled. If there was one thing Nathan didn't like, it was being called old man. He was a wizard, a prophet of unparalleled ability, and thought he should be viewed with wonder, if not open awe. She was restraining his gift by choking it off with his radahan, or no doubt the sergeant's saddle would be aflame by now. She was also preventing him from speaking. Nathan's tongue was at least as dangerous as his power. I'm afraid my brother is deaf and dumb, she gestured to the two outlaws with a shooing motion of her hand. They waved and scrambled for the woods, kicking up snow as they went. My brother has always amused himself by practicing hand tricks. Ma'am, are you sure those two aren't causing you any trouble? Oh, no, she scoffed. The sergeant lifted his reins, the twenty men behind him doing the same in response, ready to take out after him. Well, I think we'll have a little talk with him anyway, a little talk about thieving. If you do, be sure to ask them to tell you about how the Daharan soldiers stole their family's stores of food and how they're starving because of it. The square-jawed soldier lowered the reins. I don't know anything about what was done before, but the new Lord Rawl has given explicit orders that there will be no stealing of anything by the army. The new Lord Rawl? He nodded. Richard Rawl, the master of Dehara. From the corner of her eye, she saw a smile twitch across Nathan's lips. It was a smile for a properly taken fork in a prophecy. Though it had to be, were they to succeed, it brought her no smile, but an inner pang of agony for the path ahead now confirmed. Only the alternative was worse. Yes, I do believe I've heard the name now that you mention it. The sergeant stood in the stirrups and turned back to his men. Ogden, Spalding. Their horses kicked up snow when they leaped ahead. Go after those boys and take them to their families. Find out if what they say is true about their stores being stolen by troops. If it is, find out the number in their families and if there are any others in the neighborhood under the same circumstances. Take a report back to Aiden Drill at once and see to it that they get what they need to eat to see them through the winter. The two men saluted with a fist to the dark leather and mail over their hearts and then galloped their horses down the tracks leading into the woods. The sergeant turned back to her. Lord Rawls' orders, he explained. Are you headed to Aiden Drill? Yes, we're hoping to find safety there, like the others traveling north. You'll find it then, but it comes at a cost. I'll tell you the same as all the others. Whatever your former homeland, you will now be subjects of Dehara. Your allegiance is required, along with a small portion of what you earn in your labor, if you wish to come to territory held by Dehara. She lifted an eyebrow. It would seem the army is still thieving from the people. It might seem so to you, but not to Lord Rall and his word is law. All paid the same in order to support the troops who have been charged with protecting our freedom. If you don't wish to pay, you are free not to seek that protection and freedom. Seems like Lord Rall has things well in hand. The sergeant nodded. He is a powerful wizard. Nathan's shoulders shook with a silent laugh. The sergeant's eyes narrowed. What's he laughing about if he's supposed to be deaf and dumb? Oh, he is, but he's also a half-wit. Anne strolled toward the horses. As she crossed in front of the broad-shouldered wizard, she landed a sharp elbow in his gut. Laughs like that at the oddest times. She scowled up as Nathan coughed. He's liable to start drooling in a moment if he keeps at it. Anne stroked a gentle hand along Bella's sleek, powerful golden flanks. Bella danced with delight at her touch. The big mare hopefully stuck her tongue out. She liked nothing better than having someone tug on it. Anne obliged her, and then scratched behind an ear. Bella whinnied with a hoarse giggle and stuck the tongue out again, hoping for the game to continue. You are saying, Sergeant, about how Lord Rall is a powerful wizard? That's right. He slew the creatures you'll see on pikes before the palace. Creatures? He calls them Mriswith, ugly, scaled, lizard-like things. They've killed a number of people, but Lord Rall himself cut them to pieces. Mriswith. That was certainly not good news. Is there a town near where we could find food and lodging for the night? Ten Oaks is just over the next rise, maybe two miles. There is a small inn there. And how far to Aidendrill? 
He appraised their four horses as she stroked Bella's ear. With animals as fine as those, I doubt it will take you more than seven or eight days. Thank you, Sergeant. It's good to know there are soldiers about in case there are outlaws in the neighborhood. He glanced over at Nathan, taking in his towering form, his long white hair that brushed his shoulders, his strong, clean-shaven jaw, and his hooded, penetrating, dark azure eyes. Nathan was a ruggedly handsome man filled with vigor, despite the fact that he was close to a thousand years old. The sergeant looked back to her, clearly preferring to exchange glances with a squat old woman rather than with Nathan. Even with his power choked off, Nathan presented an intimidating presence. We're looking for someone. The blood of the fold. Blood of the fold? You mean those pompous fools from Nicobarese in the red capes? The sergeant snugged the reins as his horse tried to step sideways. Others of the twenty horses pawed the snow looking for grass or nibbled hopefully at dry branches to the side of the road, tails lazily swishing the cool evening air. That's them. Two men, one the Lord General of the Blood, another officer, and a woman. They escaped from Aidendril, and Lord Rall has ordered them brought back. We have men out everywhere scouring the countryside. Sorry, but I haven't seen a sign of them. Is Lord Rall staying at the Wizard's Keep? No, at the Confessor's Palace. Anne sighed. That's good, at least. His brow drew together. Why is that good? She hadn't realized she had spoken her relief aloud. Oh, well, it's just that I'm hoping to see this great man. And if he stays at the keep, then I wouldn't be able to. It's protected by magic, I hear. If he comes out on a balcony at the palace to greet the people, I might get to see him. Well... Thank you for your help, Sergeant. I think we best get to Ten Oaks before it gets pitch black. Don't want one of my horses to step in a hole and break a leg. The Sergeant bid her a good night and led his column of men up the road away from Aidendrill. Only after they were more than out of earshot did she withdraw the block from Nathan's voice. It was difficult to maintain such control for long periods of time. Anne mentally braced for the inevitable tirade as she started gathering up their packs from the snow. We best be on our way, she told him. Nathan drew himself up with an imperious scowl. You would give gold to robbers. You should have. They were only boys, Nathan. They were hungry. They tried to rob us. Anne smiled as she tossed a pack over Bella. You know as well as I that that would not have happened. But I gave them a little more than gold. I don't think they will be trying that again. He grunted. I hope the spell you put on it burns their fingers to the bone. Help me with our things. I want to get to the inn. There was a message in the journey book. Nathan was struck speechless for only an instant. Took her long enough. We left her enough hints for a child of ten to figure it out long before now. We did everything but leave a note pinned to her dress that said, By the way, the prelate and the prophet aren't really dead, you dolt. Anne cinched Bella's girth strap tight. I'm sure it wasn't as easy for her as you make it out to be. It seems obvious to us only because we knew. She had no reason to suspect. Verna figured it out. That's all that is important. Nathan replied with a lofty snort before he finally started helping by gathering up the rest of the packs. Well, what did she say? I don't know yet. When we get settled for the night, we'll find out. Nathan lifted a finger in her direction. You pull the deaf and dumb trick on me again and you will live to regret it. She turned an angry scowl on him. And if we again come across people and you start yelling that you've been abducted by a mad witch and held prisoner in a magic collar, I'll make you deaf and dumb for real. Nathan huffed sourly as he went back to work. As he turned to his horse, she saw him smile to himself in satisfaction. By the time they found the inn, and after they had left their horses with the boy at the stable out back, the stars were out and the small winter moon was visible over a distant mountain slope. The wood smoke hugging the ground, also carried the aroma of stew. She gave the stable boy a penny to carry in their things. Ten Oaks was a small community, and the inn had only a dozen locals at the few tables, mostly drinking and smoking pipes over stories of soldiers they had seen, and rumored alliances forged by the new Lord Rall, who not all were sure was really in command of Aidendrill, as was claimed. Others asked them to then explain why the Daharan troops had suddenly become so disciplined if it wasn't because someone had finally brought them to task. Nathan, wearing high boots, brown trousers, a ruffled white shirt buttoned up over his radahan, an open dark green vest, 
and a heavy dark brown cape hanging almost to the floor, strolled up to the short counter set before a few bottles and kegs. With a noble air, he flipped his cape back over a shoulder as he settled a boot to the footrail. Nathan relished wearing clothes other than the black robes he always wore at the palace. He called it playing down. The humorless innkeeper smiled only after Nathan had slid silver his way and advised that for the high price of lodging, it had better include a meal. The innkeeper shrugged and agreed. Before she knew it, Nathan was already spinning a tale that he was a merchant traveling with his mistress while his wife was home raising his 12 strapping sons. The man wanted to know what sort of merchandise Nathan dealt in. Nathan leaned close, lowered his commanding voice, and winked at the man as he told him that it would be safer if he didn't know. The impressed innkeeper straightened and handed Nathan a mug on the house. Nathan toasted the Ten Oaks Inn, the innkeeper, and the patrons before he started for the stairs, telling the innkeeper to bring a mug for his woman when he brought their stew. Every eye in the inn followed him, marveling at the impressive stranger among them. Pressing her lips tight, Anne vowed not to let herself be distracted again, giving Nathan enough time to make up their pretense at being there. It was the journey book that had distracted her. She wanted to know what it said, but she was apprehensive about it too. Something could easily have gone wrong, and one of the Sisters of the Dark could have the book and have discovered the two of them were still alive. They couldn't afford that. She pressed her fingers against a pang in her stomach. For all she knew, the Palace of the Prophets was already in the hands of the enemy. The room was small but clean, with two narrow pallets, a whitewashed stand holding a tin wash basin and chipped ewer, and a square table atop which Nathan set an oil lamp he had carried in from the bracket beside the door. The innkeeper was not far behind with bowls of lamb stew and brown bread, followed by the stable boy with their bags. After both had gone and closed the door, Anne sat and scooted her chair up to the table. Well, Nathan said, aren't you going to give me a lecture? No, Nathan, I'm tired. He flourished a hand. I thought it only fair in view of the deaf-mute business. His expression turned dark. I've been held in this collar all but the first four years of my life. How would you feel being a captive your whole life? Anne mused to herself that, being his keeper, she was nearly as much a captive as he. She met his glare. Though you never believe me when I say it, Nathan, I will tell you again that I wish it weren't so. It brings me no pleasure to keep one of the Creator's children a prisoner for no crime but his birth. After a long silence, he withdrew the glare. His hands clasped behind his back, Nathan strolled the room, giving it a critical appraisal. His boots thumped across the plank floor. Not what I'm accustomed to, he announced to no one in particular. Anne pushed away the bowl of stew and set the journey book on the table, staring at the black leather cover for a time before finally opening it and turning to the writing. You must first tell me the reason you chose me the last time. I remember every word. One mistake, and this journey book feeds the fire. My, 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 she murmured. She's being very cautious. Good. Nathan peered over Anne's shoulder as she pointed. Look at the strokes at how hard she pressed. Verna looks to be angry. Anne stared at the words. She knew what Verna meant. She must really hate me. Anne whispered as the words on the page wavered in her watery gaze. Nathan straightened. So what? I hate you, and it never seems to bother you. Do you, Nathan? Do you really hate me? His only answer was a dismissive grunt. Have I told you that this plan of yours is madness? Not since breakfast. Well, it is, you know. Anne stared at the words in the journey book. You've worked before to influence which fork is taken in prophecy, Nathan, because you know what can happen down the wrong path, and you also know how vulnerable the prophecies are to corruption. What good will it do, everyone, if you get yourself killed with this foolhardy plan, and me with you? I'd like to live to see a thousand, you know. You're going to get us both killed. Anne rose from her chair. She laid a gentle hand on his muscular arm. Tell me then, Nathan, what you would do. You know the prophecies. You know the threat. You yourself are the one who warned me. Tell me what you would do if it were up to you. He shared a gaze with her for a long moment. The fire left his eyes as he put a big hand over hers. The same as you, Anne. It's our only chance. But it doesn't make me feel any better knowing the danger to you. I know, Nathan. Are they there? Are they in Aidendrill? 
one is, he said quietly as he squeezed her hand, and the other will be there around the time we arrive. I have seen it in the prophecy. And this age that is upon us is tangled with a warren of prophecies. War draws prophecies like dung draws flies. Branches go in every direction. Every one of them must be negotiated properly. If we take the wrong path on any of them, we walk into oblivion. Worse, there are gaps where I don't know what must be done. Worse yet, there are others involved who must also take the correct fork, and we have no control over them. Anne could find no words, and so nodded instead. She sat back at the table and inched her chair close. Nathan straddled the other chair and broke off a chunk of brown bread, chewing while he watched her draw the stylus from the spine of the journey book. Anne wrote, Tomorrow night, when the moon is up, go to the place you found this. She closed the book and returned it to a pocket in her gray dress. Nathan spoke around his mouth full of bread. I hope she is smart enough to justify your faith. We trained her as best we could, Nathan. We sent her away from the palace for 20 years so she might learn to use her wits. We have done all we can. Now we must have faith in her. Anne kissed the finger where the prelate's ring had been all those years. Dear creator, give her strength too. Nathan blew on a spoonful of hot stew. I want a sword, he announced. Her brow wrinkled. You're a wizard with full command of his gift. Why, in the name of creation, would you want a sword? He regarded her as if she were witless. Because I would look dashing with a sword at my hip. Chapter 29 Please, Catherine whispered. Richard stared into her soft brown eyes as he gently touched the side of her radiant face, brushing a black ringlet back from her cheek. When they looked into each other's eyes, it was near to impossible for them to look away unless she did so first. He was having that difficulty now. Her hand on his waist sent warm sensations of longing coursing through him. He struggled desperately to put an image of Kalin in his mind in order to resist the compulsion to take Catherine in his arms and say yes. His body burned to do so. I'm tired, he lied. Sleep was the last thing he wanted. It's been a long day. Tomorrow we'll be together again, but I want... He touched her lips to silence her. He knew that if he heard those words from her again, it would be one time too many. The implied offer of her lips as they sucked the end of his finger with a wet kiss was nearly as impossible to resist as the overt invitation of her words. In the fog of his mind, he could hardly form coherent thoughts. He managed to form one. Dear spirits, help me. Give me strength. My heart belongs to Kalen. Tomorrow, he managed. You said that yesterday, and it took me hours to find you, she whispered as she kissed his ear. Richard had been using the Mriswith cape to make himself invisible. It was just a little easier to resist when she couldn't appeal to him directly, but it only delayed the inevitable. When he saw her frantic to find him, he couldn't bear to see her in distress as she searched for him and would end up going to her. As her hand came up to his neck, he took it and administered it a quick kiss. Sleep well, Catherine. I'll see you in the morning. Richard glanced to Egan standing ten feet away with his back to the wall and his arms folded as he stared ahead as if he saw nothing. Beyond, in the shadows at the end of the gloomy hall, Berdine stood guard too. She made no pretense at not seeing him standing at the door with Catherine pressed up against him. She observed without expression. His other guards, Ulick, Kara, and Raina, were getting some sleep. Richard slipped a hand behind his back and turned the doorknob. His weight against the door caused it to spring open, and as it did, he stepped aside, and Catherine stumbled into her room. She caught herself by his hand. Looking into his eyes, she kissed his hand. His knees nearly buckled. Knowing he could resist her no longer if he didn't remove himself from the sight of her, he took back his hand. He was mentally making excuses to himself as to why it would be all right to give in. What could it hurt? Why was it so bad? Why did he think it would be so wrong? It felt like there was a thick blanket over his thoughts, suffocating them before they could get to the surface. Voices in his head tried to rationalize why he should stop this foolish resistance and simply enjoy the charms of this gorgeous creature who was making it more than stone-cold obvious that she wanted him, who in fact was begging him. He felt a lump in his throat at his desire for her. He was near tears from struggling to find reasons to stop himself. His thinking churned in a mental stupor. Part of him, the largest part, desperately struggled to make him abandon his resistance, 
but a small dim part of his mind fought fiercely, trying to hold him back, trying to warn him that something was wrong. It made no sense. What could be wrong? Why was it wrong? What was it in him that was trying to stop him? Dear spirits, help me. An image of Kaelin came to him, and he saw her smile, that smile she gave no other but him. He saw her lips moving. She said she loved him. I need to be alone with you, Richard, Catherine said. I can't wait any longer. Good night, Catherine. Sleep well. I'll see you in the morning. He pulled the door closed. Panting with exhaustion at the effort, he closed the door to his room after he entered. His shirt was soaked with sweat. With a weak arm, he reached up and shoved the bolt to the door into place. It broke as he drove it home. He stared at the bracket as it swung, hanging by one screw. In the dim light coming from the fire in the hearth, he couldn't see the other screws on the ornate carpets. He was so hot he could hardly breathe. Richard pulled the baldric over his head and dropped his sword to the floor on his way to the window. With the effort of a drowning man, he twisted the latch and threw the window open, gasping as if he couldn't get his breath. Cold air filled his lungs, but did little to cool him. His room was on the ground floor, and he briefly contemplated stepping over the sill and rolling in the snow. He decided against it, and settled on letting the cold air waft over him as he stared out into the night at the moonlit, secluded garden. Something was wrong, but he couldn't make himself grasp it. He wanted to be with Catherine, but something inside was fighting it. Why? He couldn't understand why he would want to fight his desire for her. He thought again about Kaelin. That was why. But if he loved Kaelin, why would he be having such an intense desire for Catherine? He could think of little but her. He was having trouble keeping the memory of Kaelin in his head. Richard shuffled to the bed. He instinctively knew that he had reached the end of his ability to resist his lust for Catherine. He sat on the edge of the bed in a daze as his head spun. The door opened. Richard looked up. It was her. She was wearing something so sheer that the dim light in the hall silhouetted her body underneath. She crossed the room toward him. Richard, please, she said in that soft voice that paralyzed him. Don't send me away this time. Please, I will die if I can't be with you right now. Die? Dear spirits, he didn't want her to die. Richard nearly burst into tears at the very thought. She glided closer into the firelight. The softly pleated nightdress reached the floor but did nothing to hide what was beneath it, merely softening her body into a vision of beauty beyond anything he could have imagined. The sight ignited him. He could think of nothing but what he was seeing and how much he wanted her. If he didn't have her, he would die of unrealized desire. As she stood over him with one hand behind her back, she smiled as she stroked his face with the other. He could feel the heat of her flesh. She bent and brushed her lips against his. He thought he would die of pleasure. Her hand went to his chest. Lie down, my love. Catherine whispered as she pushed him back. He flopped back on the bed, staring up at her through the numb agony of desire. Richard thought of Kaelin. He was powerless. Richard dimly remembered some of the things Nathan had told him about using his gift. It was within him, and anger could bring it out. But he felt no anger. Instinct was how a war wizard used his gift, Nathan had told him. He remembered abandoning himself to that instinct when he was about to die at the hands of Liliana, a sister of the dark. He had given sanction to the inner power. He had let his instinctive use of need bring the power to life. Catherine put a knee on the bed. At long last, my love. In helpless abandon, Richard gave himself over to that calm center, the instinct beyond the veil within his mind. He let himself fall into that dark void. He relinquished control of his actions to what would be. He was lost either way. Clarity ignited, scorching the fog away in seething ripples. He looked up to see a woman for whom he had no feelings. With cold lucidity, he understood. Richard had been touched by magic before. He knew its feel. The shroud had been shattered. There was magic about this woman. With the fog gone, he could feel its cold fingers in his mind. But why? Then he saw the knife. The blade glinted in the firelight as she lifted it over her head. With a wild rush of strength, he flung himself to the door as Catherine buried the knife in the bedding. She drew it back again as she dove toward him. It was too late for her now. He cocked his legs to kick her back, but in a confusion of sensations and realizations, Richard felt the presence of a mriswith, and at nearly the same time, 
he saw it materialize as it dove through the air above him. And then the world went red. He felt warm blood splatter his face as he saw the filmy nightdress slashed open. Severed edges of diaphanous material fluttered as if in a blast of wind. The three blades ripped Catherine nearly in two. The Mriswith crashed to the floor beyond. Richard spun out from underneath her and sprang to his feet as she toppled back, the shocking gore of her insides sloshing across the carpet. Her terrible gasps died out in heaving pants. Richard crouched, his feet and his hands spread wide, facing the Mriswith on the other side of her. The Mriswith had a three-bladed knife in each claw. Between them, Catherine writhed in the agony of death. The Mriswith took a step back toward the window, its beady eyes staying on Richard. It took another step, drawing its black cape over one scaled arm as its gaze swept the room. Richard dove for his sword. He slid to a stop as the Mriswith planted a clawed foot atop the scabbard, holding it to the floor. No, it hissed. She was going to kill you. The same as you. No, I protect you, skin brother. Dumbfounded, Richard stared up at the dark shape. The Mriswith flung the cape around itself and dove through the window into the night, vanishing as it leapt. Richard lunged toward the window to grab it. His arms caught only air as he landed across the windowsill, hanging halfway out into the night. The Mriswith was gone. He could no longer feel its presence in his mind. In the emptiness left by the departure of the Mriswith, Richard's mind filled with the mental image of Catherine squirming in a mass of her guts. He vomited out the window. When his racking heaves finished and his head stopped spinning, he staggered back to where she lay to kneel beside her. He thanked the spirits that she was dead and no longer suffered. Even if she had tried to kill him, he couldn't stand to watch her suffering in the throes of death. He stared at her face. He couldn't imagine the feelings he had had for her that he now only dimly remembered. She was just an ordinary woman, but she had been shrouded in magic. It was some sort of spell that had overpowered his reason. He had come to his senses with no time to spare. His gift had broken the spell. The top half of her slashed nightdress was thrown up around her neck. A cold feeling that gave him goosebumps turned his attention to her breasts. Richard's eyes narrowed and he leaned closer, staring. He reached out and touched her right nipple. He touched the left. It wasn't the same. He carried a lamp to the fire and lit it with a long splinter of kindling. He returned to the body and held the lamp near her left breast. Richard wet his thumb on his tongue and rubbed the smooth nipple. It came off. With her nightdress, he cleaned the paint from her breast to leave a smooth, unbroken mound of skin. Catherine had no left nipple. The calm center within radiated an aura of comprehension. This was connected to the spell she had over him. He didn't know how, but it was. Richard suddenly sat back on his heels. He sat a moment, wide-eyed, and then sprang up, running to the door. He stopped. Why should he be thinking this? He had to be wrong. What if he wasn't? He opened the door just enough to slip through and then shut it behind himself. Egan glanced his way, his arms still folded, and resumed his stance. Richard peered down the hall to Berdine in her red leather, leaning against the wall. She was watching him. Richard crooked his finger, gesturing her to come to him. She straightened and then strolled up the hall. Berdine glanced at the door as she stopped before him. She frowned up to his eyes. The Duchess wishes to be with you. Go back to her. Go get Kara and Raina, and the three of you get back here. His voice took on the heat of his glower. Right now. Is something right now? She looked to the door again and then strode off without further word. When she had disappeared around the hall at the end of the corridor, Richard turned to Egan, who was again watching him. Why did you let her come into my room? Egan's brow wrinkled in puzzlement. He lifted a hand toward the door. Well, the way she is dressed. She said you wanted her tonight and that you told her to put that on and come to you. Egan cleared his throat. It was obvious why you wanted her. I thought you would be angry if I kept her from you after you had told her to come to you in the night. Richard turned the knob and flung open the door. He held his arm out in invitation. Egan hesitated and then entered. He stiffened as he stood over her remains. Lord Rall, I'm sorry. I saw no Mriswith. I would have stopped it if I had, 
or at least have tried to warn you, I swear. He groaned. Dear spirits, what a way to die. Lord Rall, I've failed you. Look in her hand, Egan. He glanced along the length of her arm to see the knife still clutched in her fist. What the... I didn't ask her to come to me. She came to my room to kill me. Egan's eyes turned away. He clearly knew the implications. Any past Lord Rall would execute a guard for such a failure. She fooled me too, Egan. It's not your fault. But don't you ever let a woman other than my future wife into my room again, understand? If a woman comes to my room, you get my permission to let her in, no matter what. He clapped a fist to his heart. Yes, Lord Rall. Egan, please roll her up in that carpet and get her out of here. Put her in her room for now. Take up your post in the hall, and when the three moored Sith return, send them in. Without questioning the instructions, Egan bent to the task. With his strength and size, it was only a minor effort. After he had inspected the broken door bolt, Richard pulled out a chair from the table and turned it around next to the fireplace and sat facing the door. He hoped he was wrong. What was he going to do if he wasn't? He sat in the quiet, listening to the fire crackle and waited for the three women. Come, he called out in response to the knock. Kara entered, followed by Raina, both in their brown leather, with Berdeen bringing up the rear. The first two glanced about casually as they crossed the room. Berdeen swept the room with a more focused search. The three came to a halt before him. Yes, Lord Rall? Kara asked without emotion. You wish something? Richard folded his arms. Show me your breasts, all three of you. Kara's mouth opened to say something, but she closed it and setting her jaw, started undoing the buttons running up the side of her ribs. Raina glanced to Kara and saw that she was doing as ordered. Reluctantly at first, she started undoing the buttons too. Berdine watched the other two. Slowly, she started slipping the buttons at the side of her red leather outfit. When finished, Kara gripped the top of the leather at the side but didn't open it. Smoldering resentment settled in her expression. Richard rearranged the unsheathed sword in his lap and crossed his legs. I'm waiting, he said. Kara took a final breath of resignation and pulled the front of her outfit open. In the flickering light coming from the recently stoked fire in the hearth, Richard studied each nipple and the wavering shadow cast by each raised knob in the center. Both had the proper contour of flesh and not the flat profile of paint put there to mimic. He shifted his gaze to Raina in silent command. He said nothing as he waited. He could see her fighting to keep silent and at the same time fighting to decide what to do. She pressed her lips tight in indignation but finally reached up and yanked the leather aside. Richard gave her breasts the same careful appraisal. Her nipples, too, were both real. His gaze slid to Berdine. She was the one who had threatened him. She was the one who had lifted her Aegeal to him. It wasn't humiliation but rage that had her face as red as her outfit. You said we didn't have to do this. You promised us. You said you would not show me. Kara and Raina shifted their weight uncomfortably, not liking this one bit, as if they expected he was choosing one of them for the night. But at the same time, neither was willing to do anything to go against the wishes of the Lord Rall. Still, Berdine didn't move. He hardened his glare. That's an order. You are sworn to obey me. Do as I say. Tears of anger leaked from her eyes. She reached up and tore the leather aside. She had only one nipple. Her left breast was smooth and unbroken. Her chest heaved with ire. The other two stared at her smooth left breast in open astonishment. By the looks on their faces, Richard knew they had seen her breasts before. When their Aegeal suddenly spun into their fists, he knew that this wasn't what they had expected to see this time. Richard came to his feet, addressing Kara and Raina. Forgive me for doing that to you. He gestured for all of them to cover themselves. Berdine stood shaking in rage, not moving, as the other two began to button their leather up the side. What's going on? Kara asked him, her dangerous eyes on Berdine the whole time she worked at the tight buttons. I'll tell you later. You two may leave. We're not going anywhere, Raina said in a grave tone as her eyes, too, stayed on Berdine. Yes, you are, Richard pointed toward the door. He lifted a finger to Berdeen. You stay right there. Kara stepped protectively closer to him. We're not... Don't argue with me. I'm not in the mood. Out. Kara and Raina flinched back in surprise. 
With a final furious sigh, Kara motioned to Raina and left the room, closing the door behind him. Berdine's Aegeel spun up into her fist. What did you do with her? Who did this to you, Berdine? He said in a gentle voice. She stepped closer. What did you do with her? Richard, his mind now clear, could feel the spell around her as she put herself close to him. He could feel the distinctive tingle of magic, its uncomfortable prickling sensation in his gut. This was not benevolent magic. In her eyes, he could see more than magic. He could see the fury of a moored Sith unleashed. She died trying to kill me. I knew I should have done it myself. She shook her head in disgust. Kneel, she commanded through gritted teeth. Berdine, I'm not. She lashed out with her Aegeel, striking him across the shoulder, knocking him back. Don't you dare address me by my name. She had been faster than he had expected. He gasped with the pain as he clutched his shoulder. Every memory of an Aegeel being used against him came stunningly fresh to his mind. He was abruptly flushed with doubt. He didn't know if he could do this. But his only alternative was to kill her, and he had sworn he wouldn't do that. The bone-burning torture searing through his shoulder made his resolve falter. Berdine stalked closer. Pick up your sword. He stiffened his will as he regained his feet. Berdine laid the Aegeel on his shoulder, forcing him to his knees. He struggled to maintain his focus. Denna had taught him to endure this. He must now. He picked up the sword and staggered to his feet again. Try to use it on me, she commanded. Richard looked to her cold blue eyes, fighting the tug of panic within his soul. No, he tossed the sword on the bed. I am the Lord Rawl. You are bonded to me. She screamed in fury as she drove the Aegeel into his gut. The room spun as he realized he was on his back. Breathless, he again struggled to his feet when she commanded it. Use your knife, fight me! With shaking fingers, Richard pulled his knife from the sheath at his belt and held it hilt first to her. No, kill me if that's what you really want. She snatched the knife from his hand. You make this easy for me. I intended to make you suffer, but your death is all that is required. Richard, his insides in an agony of lingering, burning pain, used all his strength to put his chest out. He pointed. Here is my heart, Berdine. The Lord Rawl's heart. The Lord Rawl you are bonded to. He tapped his chest again. Stab me here if you wish to kill me. She gave him a gruesome smile. Fine, you shall have your wish. No, not my wish, yours. I don't want you to kill me. She faltered. Her brow twitched. Protect yourself. No, Berdine. If this is what you wish, then you must choose it for yourself. Fight me! She struck him across the face with the Aegeel. It felt like his jaw shattered and all his teeth were knocked out. The pain stabbed into his ear, nearly blinding him with hurt. Panting in a cold sweat, he straightened. Berdine, you have two magics in you. One is your bond to me. The other is what was put there when they took your nipple. You cannot continue to carry both. One has to be broken. I'm your Lord Rahl. You are bonded to me. The only way you can kill me is to break that bond. My life is in your hands. She lunged at him. He felt the back of his head smack against the floor. Berdine was atop him, screaming in fury. Fight me, you bastard! She pounded his chest with one fist as she held the knife up in the other. Tears streamed from her eyes. Fight me, fight me, fight me! No, if you want to kill me, then you have to do it on your own. Fight me! She struck his face. I can't kill you if you don't fight me. Defend yourself! Richard enfolded her in his arms and pulled her to his chest. He pushed his heels against the carpet and slid himself back, taking her with him as he sat up against the bed. Berdine, just as you are bonded to me, I protect you. I won't let you die like this. I want you alive. I want you as my protector. No, she screamed. I must kill you. You must fight me so I can. I can't do it unless you try to kill me. You must. Weeping in angry exasperation, she pressed the knife against his throat. Richard did nothing to stop her. He drew his hand down her wavy brown hair. Berdine, I've sworn to fight to protect those who want to live free. That's my bond to you. I won't do anything to harm you. I know you don't want to kill me. You've sworn on your life to protect me. I'll kill you. I will. I'll kill you. I believe in you, Berdine, in your oath to me. I put my life in your word and your bond. She gasped in racking sobs as she looked into his eyes. She shook as she wept uncontrollably. 
Richard didn't move against the sharp blade at his throat. Then you must kill me, she cried. Please, I can stand it no longer. Please, kill me. I will never do anything to harm you, Berdine. I've given you your freedom. You are answerable to yourself. Berdine let out a long wail of misery and then threw the knife across the floor. She collapsed against him, throwing her arms around his neck. Oh, Lord Rall, she sobbed. Forgive me. Forgive me. Oh, dear spirits, what have I done? You have proven your bond, he whispered as he held her. They hurt me, she wept. They hurt me so much. Nothing ever hurt like that before. It hurts so to fight it now. He held her tight. I know, but you must fight it. She put a hand to his chest and pushed back. I can't. Richard didn't think he had ever seen anyone in such misery. Please, Lord Raoul, kill me. I can't stand the pain. I beg you, please kill me. Richard, in an agony of empathy for her suffering, drew her back to his chest and hugged her, stroking her head, trying to comfort her. It did no good. She only cried harder. He set her back against the bed as she shook and wept. Without thinking about what he was doing or even understanding the reason, he cupped his hand over her left breast. Richard sought the calm center, the place without thought, the fount of peace within, and cloaked himself in instinct. He felt the searing pain seep through him, her pain. He felt what had been done to her and what the lingering magic was doing to her now. As he had done with the pain of the Aegeal, he endured it. In his empathy, he felt the torment of her life, the torture of what it meant to become a moored Sith, and the anguish of her former self lost. His eyes closed, he took it unto himself. Though he didn't see the events involved, he understood the trail of scars they left through her soul. He hardened his will in order to endure the suffering of it. He stood, a rock, in a torrent of hurt rushing into his own soul. He was that rock for her. He let his loving regard for this innocent, this fellow victim of suffering, flow into her. Without fully understanding the feelings he was having, he let his instinct guide him. He felt himself soaking up her suffering so that she wouldn't have to endure it, so he could help her, and at the same time he felt an inner warmth flowing outward through his hand on her flesh. Through that hand, it seemed he was connected to her spark of life, to her soul. Berdine's crying slowed, her breathing evened out, and her muscles went slack as she sank back against the bed. Richard felt the pain that had come into him from her begin to dissipate. Only then did he realize he was holding his breath with the agony of it and let the breath go. The warmth flowing from within him began to fade too and at last was gone. Richard removed his hand and brushed her wavy hair back from her face. Her eyes came open, her dazed, blue-eyed gaze meeting his. They both looked down. She was whole again. I'm myself again, she whispered. I feel as if I have just awakened from a nightmare. Richard pulled the red leather up across her breasts, covering her. Me too. There has never been a Lord Raal such as you before, she said in wonder. The spirits be praised, there never has. Greater truth has never been spoken, a voice behind said. Richard turned to see the tear-stained faces of the other two women kneeling behind him. Are you all right, Berdine? Kara asked. Berdine, still looking a bit stunned, nodded. I am myself again. None of them was as stunned as Richard. You could have killed her, Kara said. If you had tried to use your sword, she would have had your magic. But you could have used your knife. For you, it would have been easy. You didn't have to suffer her Aegeal. You could have just killed her. Richard nodded. I know, but that pain would have been worse. Berdine tossed her Aegeal to the floor before him. I give this over to you, Lord Rall. The other two pulled the gold chains down over their hands and dropped their Aegeal to the floor along with Berdine's. I, too, give mine over to you, Lord Raal, Kara said. And I, Lord Raal. Richard stared at the red rods on the floor before him. He thought about his sword and how much he hated the things he did with it, how he hated the killing he had done with it and the killing he knew he would do again. But he could not yet give up the sword. This means more to me than you can know, he said, unable to meet their eyes. That you would do this is what matters. It proves your hearts and your bond. Forgive me, all of you, but I must ask you to keep them for now. He handed back their Aegeal. When this is over, when we are free of the threat, then we can all give up the phantoms that haunt us. But for now, we must fight for those who count on us. Our weapons, terrible as they are, allow us to continue the struggle. 
Kara laid a gentle hand to his shoulder. We understand, Lord Rolf. It shall be as you say. When this is over, we can be free of not only those enemies from without, but within, too. Richard nodded. Until then, we must be strong. We must be the wind of death. In the silence, Richard wondered what Mrithwith were doing in Aidendrill. He thought about the one that had killed Catherine. It was protecting him, it had said. Protecting him? Impossible. As he thought about it, though, he couldn't recall a Mrithwith actually attacking him personally. He remembered the first attack outside the Confessor's palace with Gratch. Gratch had attacked them, and Richard had come to the aid of his friend. They had been intent on killing Green Eyes, as they had called the Gar, but they never specifically attacked him. The one tonight had had the best chance of all. Richard had been without his sword, yet it didn't attack him, and instead escaped without a fight. It had addressed him as Skin Brother. Just to wonder what that could mean gave him goosebumps. Richard idly scratched his neck. Kara rubbed a finger on the back side of his neck where he had just scratched. What's this? I don't know. Just a spot that's always itching. Chapter 30 Verna paced indignantly back and forth in the little sanctuary. How dare Prelate Annalina do this? Verna had told her that she had to tell her the word so as to prove it was really her, to say once again that she regarded Verna as an unremarkable sister of little note. Verna wanted the prelate to say those cruel words again so she would know that Verna knew she was being used and of little value to the palace in the prelate's eyes. If she was going to be used and follow the prelate's orders like an earnest sister was duty-bound to do, it would be knowingly this time. Verna was done weeping. She was not going to jump whenever that woman cavalierly crooked a finger. Verna had not devoted her entire life to being a sister of the light, worked so hard for so many years to be treated with such disrespect. The thing that made her the most angry was that she had done it again. Verna had told the prelate that she first had to say the words to prove it was really her, or Verna would feed the journey book to the fire. Verna had set the rules. Prove yourself first. Instead, the prelate had crooked her finger and Verna had jumped. She should just throw the journey book in a fire, destroy it, let the prelate try to use her then. Let her see that Verna was finished with being played for a fool. See how she liked having her wishes disregarded. It would serve her right. That was what she should have done, but she hadn't. She still had the book tucked in her belt. Despite her hurt, she was still a sister. She had to be sure. The prelate still hadn't proved to her that she was really alive and had the other book. When she was sure, then Verna would throw the book in the fire. Verna stopped pacing and looked out through one of the windows in the gable ends. The moon was up. This time there would be no grace if her instructions weren't followed. She vowed that either the prelate did as requested and prove her identity, or Verna was going to burn the book. This was the prelate's last chance. Verna pulled the branched candlestick away from the small altar draped with a white cloth trimmed in gold thread and set it beside the little table. The perforated bowl in which Verna had found the journey book in the first place set atop the white cloth on the altar. Instead of the journey book, it now held a small flame. If the prelate failed again to do as instructed, the journey book was going back into that bowl into the flames. She pulled the small black book from its pouch in her belt and set it on the little table as she pulled the three-legged stool close. Verna kissed the prelate's ring on her ring finger, took a deep breath, said a prayer beseeching the Creator's guidance, and opened the book. There was a message, pages of it, in fact. My dearest Verna, it began. Verna pursed her lips, dearest Verna indeed. My dearest Verna, first the easy part. I asked you to go to the sanctuary because of the danger involved. We cannot take any chance that others will read my messages, much less discover that Nathan and I are alive. The sanctuary is the only place I could be sure no one else would read this, and that is the only reason I failed to follow your reasonable precaution before now. You, of course, should expect me to prove myself, and now that I can be sure that you are alone and safe from discovery, I will provide the proof. In accordance with this caution of only using the sanctuary to communicate, you must be sure to erase all messages before you leave the protection of the sanctuary. Before I go on, the proof. As you requested, this is what I told you in my office the first time I saw you after you returned from your journey to recover Richard. 
I chose you, Verna, because you were far down on the list and because all in all you are quite unremarkable. I doubted you were one of them. You are a person of little note. I'm sure Grace and Elizabeth made their way to the top of the list because whoever directs the Sisters of the Dark considered them expendable. I direct the Sisters of the Light. I chose you for the same reason. There are sisters who are valuable to our cause. I could not risk one of them on such a task. The boy may prove a value to us, but he is not as important as other matters at the palace. It was simply an opportunity I thought to take. If there had been trouble and none of you made it back, well, I'm sure you can understand that a general would not want to lose his best troops on a low-priority mission. Verna turned the book over on the table and put her face in her hands. There was no doubt. It was Prelate Annalena who had the other journey book. She was alive, as probably was Nathan. She glanced to the little fire burning in the bowl. The hurt of those words turned in her chest. Reluctantly, with trembling fingers, she turned the book back over and read on. Verna, I know that these words must have broken your heart to hear. I do know that it broke my heart to say them, because they were not true. It must seem to you that you are being used in a nefarious way. It is wrong to lie, but it is worse to let the wicked triumph because you adhere to the truth at the expense of good sense. If the Sisters of the Dark were to ask me what my plans were, I would lie. To do otherwise is to allow wickedness to triumph. I will now tell you the truth, realizing that you have no reason to believe that this time my words are true, but I believe in your intelligence and know that if you weigh my words, you will be able to see the truth in them. The true reason I chose you to go after Richard is because of all the sisters, you were the one I trusted with the fate of the world. You know now the battle Richard won against the Keeper. Without him, we would have all been lost to the world of the dead. A low-priority mission, it was not. It was the most important journey any sister had ever been sent on. I trusted only you. Over three hundred years before you were born, Nathan warned me of the danger to the world of life. Five hundred years before Richard was born, Nathan and I knew that a war wizard would come into this world. The prophecies told us some of what must be accomplished. The challenge was unlike any we have faced before. When Richard was born, Nathan and I traveled by ship around the Great Barrier to the New World. We recovered a book of magic from the wizard's keep in Adendril to keep it out of Dark and Rawl's hands and gave the book to Richard's stepfather, securing his promise that he would make Richard learn it. Only through such trials and events in his life at his home could this young man be forged into the kind of person with the wits to stop the first threat, darken Rawl, his real father, and later restore the balance to the world of life. He is perhaps the most important person born in the last 3,000 years. Richard is the war wizard who will lead us in the final battle, the prophecies tell us this, but not whether we will prevail. This is now a battle for mankind. Our only chance was to make sure above all else that he was not tainted in his training as a man. In this battle, magic is needed, but heart must rule it. I sent you to bring him to the palace because you were the only one I could trust to accomplish the task. I knew your heart and soul, and I knew you were no sister of the dark. I'm sure you are wondering how I could let you search for him for more than twenty years when I knew where he was all the time. I also could have waited and sent you after him when he was grown and at last revealed his whereabouts when he triggered his gift. I am shamed to admit that I was using you too much as I used Richard. For the challenges that lie ahead, I needed to teach you things you could not learn at the Palace of the Prophets, while Richard grew and learned some of the essential things he required. I needed you to be able to use your wits and not the reams of rules that the sisters at the palace thrive on. I had to let you develop your innate skills in the real world. The battle ahead lies in the real world. The cloistered world of the palace is no place to learn about life. I don't expect you to ever forgive me. That too is one of the burdens a prelate must bear, the hatred of one she loves like her own daughter. When I told you those awful words, that too was to a purpose. I had to finally break you of the palace's teaching that you must always do as you were trained and blindly follow orders. I had to make you angry enough to do what you judged was right. Since you were little, I could always count on your temper. I couldn't trust that if I told you the reasons you would understand or do as was necessary. 
Sometimes a person can only properly affect events by using their own moral propriety and not by carrying out orders. It is so stated in prophecy. I trusted that you would choose right over training if you came to the conclusion yourself. The other reason I told you those things in my office was because I suspected that one of my administrators was a sister of the dark. I knew my shield would not keep my words from her ears. I let my words betray me so she would attack me and force their hand. I knew I could very possibly be killed, but I chose that fate over the possibility of the world being plunged into the grip of the Keeper. Sometimes a prelate must even use herself. So far, Verna, you have lived up to my every expectation of you. You have played a vital role in saving the world from the Keeper. With your help, we have thus far succeeded. The very first time I laid eyes on you, I smiled because you had an angry scowl on your face. Do you remember why? I will tell you if you don't. Every novice brought to the palace was given a test. Sooner or later, we wrongly blamed her for a small offense of which she was innocent. Most cried, some pouted. Some bore the shame of guilt with stoic resignation. Only you became angry at the injustice. In that you proved yourself. Nathan had found a prophecy that said the one we needed would be delivered to us not with a smile or a pout or a brave face, but with an angry scowl. When I saw that look on your face and your little arms folded in a fit, I nearly laughed aloud. At last you had been delivered into our hands. From that day, I have been using you in the Creator's most important work. I chose you to be the prelate in the illusion of my death because you are still the one sister I trust above all others. There is more than a good chance that I will be killed on my present journey with Nathan, and if I do die, you will be the prelate for real. That is the way I wish it. Your justifiable hatred weighs on my heart, but it is the Creator's forgiveness that is important, and I know I will have that much at least. I will suffer your scorn as my burden in this life, as I suffer other burdens for which there is no relief. It is the price of being prelate of the Palace of the Prophets. Verna pushed the book away, unable to read more of the words. Her head fell to her folded arms as she sobbed. Though she still didn't recall the nature of the injustice of which the prelate spoke, she remembered the sting of it and her anger. Mostly she remembered the prelate's smile and how it made the world right again. Oh, dear creator, Verna wept aloud. You truly have a fool for a servant. If she had felt heartache before for thinking the prelate had used her, she now felt agony over the anguish the prelate had had to endure. When she was finally able to bring her tears to a halt, she pulled the little book back before her and read on. But the past is past, and we must now go on with what must be done. The prophecies say that the greatest danger now lies before us. The tests that have come before would have ended the world of life in a final terrible flash. In an instant, all would be irrecoverably lost. Richard passed those tests and kept us from that fate. Now a greater trial is upon us. It is not from other worlds, but from our own. This is a battle for the future of our world, the future of mankind, and the future of magic. In this, in the struggle for the minds and hearts of men, there is no final flash, no instant end, but the inexorable grinding struggle of war, as the shadow of enslavement slowly creeps across the world and darkens the spark of magic through which comes the Creator's light. The ancient war started thousands of years ago is again aflame. We, in protecting this world from others, have unavoidably brought it to pass. This time, there will be no cessation of war because of the efforts of hundreds of wizards. This time, we have only one war wizard to lead us, Richard. I cannot tell you all of it now. Some I simply do not know, and as much as it pains me to have to leave you in the dark about some things I do know, Understand that because of forks and prophecies that must be correctly taken, it is necessary that some of the people involved act instinctively and not by instruction. To do otherwise would make the correct forks impassable. Part of our job is to hope to teach people to act in the right way so that when the test comes, they will do what must be done. Forgive me, Verna, but I must once again trust some things to the fates. I hope that you are learning as prelate that you cannot always explain everything to others, but that you must sometimes simply give them a task and expect them to do it. Verna sighed. She knew the truth of that. She herself had given up on trying to explain everything all the time. 
and had started to simply ask that instructions be carried out as spoken. Some things, though, I can tell you and must tell you so you can help us. Nathan and I have gone on a mission of vital importance. For now, only he and I can know its nature. Should I live, I intend to return to the palace. Before then, you must find out who are loyal sisters of the light, novices and young men. You must also identify all who have given their souls to the keeper. What? Verna heard herself say aloud. How can I do that? I leave it up to you to find a way. You don't have a lot of time. This is important, Verna. It must be before Emperor Jagang arrives. Nathan and I believe Jagang is what was called in the ancient war a dream walker. Verna felt the sweat between her shoulder blades trickle down her spine. She recalled her talk with Sister Simona and how the woman had screamed uncontrollably at the mere mention of Jagang's name. Sister Simona said that Jagang came to her in her dreams. Everyone thought Sister Simona was crazy. Warren, too, had spoken of the dream walker, and that in the old war they were a form of weapon. Their visit to Sister Simona had confirmed what he believed. Above all else, remember this. No matter what happens, your only salvation is to remain loyal to Richard. A dream walker can take just about anyone's mind and enslave them to his will those with the gift more so than others. There is only one protection, Richard. An ancestor of his created a magic that protects them, and any loyal to them, bonded in cause to them, from the power of the Dreamwalkers. This magic is passed down to any Rahl born with the gift. Nathan, of course, has this same protective element to his gift, but he is not the one who can lead us. He is a prophet and not a war wizard. Verna could read between the lines that being a loyal follower of Nathan would be madness. The man was lightning itself in a collar. By going against palace law of your own free will and helping Richard escape, you became bonded to him. This bond protects you from the power of the Dreamwalker, but not from his waking force of arms and minions. This is part of the reason I had to deceive you that day in my office. It made you, of your own free will, choose to help Richard over your training and orders. Goosebumps ran up Verna's arms. Had she convinced the prelate to reveal her plans, telling Verna to help Richard escape, then she would have been as vulnerable as Sister Simona to the Dreamwalker. Nathan is protected, of course, and I have been bonded to Richard for a good long time. I pledged myself to him when I first saw him, in my own way. I have been letting him set his own rules as to how he fights for our side. At times, I must tell you, it is difficult. Though he does as is needed to protect the innocent free people who need his help, he has a mind of his own, and does things that, if I had my way, he would not do. At times, he can be as much of a trial as Nathan. Such is life. I am finished telling you what I had to reveal. I am sitting here in a room in a cozy inn, waiting for you to read this. When you have read this message over as many times as you wish, I'll be waiting here, should you wish to ask me anything. You must understand that I have had hundreds of years working at events and prophecies, and there is no way I can impart all that knowledge to you in one night, much less in a journey book. But I will tell you what I can of what you wish to know. Also, you must understand that there are certain things I cannot tell you for fear of tainting prophecy and events. Every word I tell you carries a danger of that, though some more than others. But it is necessary that you know some of it. With these things in mind, I await your questions. Ask. Verna sat up straight at the end of the writing. Ask? It would take a hundred years to ask all she wanted to know. Where was she to start? Dear Creator, what were the important questions? She read the entire message again to be sure she hadn't missed anything, and then sat staring at the blank page beyond. Finally, she picked up the stylus. My dearest mother, I beg you, forgive me the things I thought of you. I am humbled by your strength and shamed by my foolish pride. Please don't get yourself killed. I am not worthy to be prelate. I am an ox that you are asking to soar like a bird. Verna sat watching the book for the return message to appear if the prelate really was waiting. Thank you, child. You have lightened my heart. Ask what you need to know, and if I can, I will answer your questions. I will sit here all night if I can help you with your burden. Verna smiled for the first time in days. This time the tears were sweet and not bitter. Prelate, 
Are you truly safe? Is everything well with you and Nathan? Verna, perhaps you enjoy having your friends calling you prelate, but I do not. Please call me by my name, as all my true friends do. Verna laughed out loud. She too was frustrated that people insisted on calling her prelate. Words continued to appear as Anne's message went on. And yes, I am fine, as is Nathan, who is presently occupied. Today he bought himself a sword, and is now having a sword fight with invisible enemies in our room. He thinks a sword will make him look dashing. He is a thousand-year-old child, and at this moment is grinning like a child as he lops the heads off his invisible foes. Verna read the message again, just to be sure she was reading it right. Nathan with a sword? The man was even more deranged than she had thought. The prelate must have her hands full.